Right. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on your location. I want, I, my name is Peggy McGuire. I'm the president of the Cambia Health Foundation and co-chair of the Roundtable, along with Dr. James Tulsky from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, at Harvard. Um, James and I would like to welcome you to the webinar. The Roundtable was established to examine the evidence and issues pertaining to the quality of care for people with serious illness. Today's webinar is about integrating serious illness care into primary care delivery. And this is actually part two of a uh, series on, uh, that we've been delivering virtually. So information about the Roundtable's activities can be found on the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine website. And uh, please go to that uh, website for more information. James and I would like to thank the sponsors of the Roundtable for their commitment to helping people with serious illness and their caregivers live well. It's by you know, coming together to look at these issues that we can um, look at best practices, what works well, what the evidence shows, and where we can um, improve care. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So thank you to all of our sponsors who make this work possible. Today's recording, uh, today's webinar will be recorded and the meeting materials will be available on the event webpage. Please um, note that an, at the end of each session, there will be time for Q&A from webinar participants. And webinar attendees, can you can type your questions into the chat box using the Q&A feature. Um, I want to thank the planning committee and especially our esteemed planning committee co-chairs, um, Dr. Phil Rogers and Dr. Patricia Davidson. They have, they're wonderful people and they have done an amazing job in working with the planning committee to put on this webinar. So I want to thank all of the planning committee members. I wanna thank the fantastic staff at the uh, National Academy. They, we are very well served by their dedicated uh, work. So thank you to the planning committee, the planning committee co-chairs and the roundtable staff. We greatly appreciate your efforts. And now, well, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce planning committee co-chair, Dr. Pat Patricia Davidson. Trish. Thanks so much, Peggy. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to provide a brief, brief summary of the first webinar. Um, our webinar on June the 10th uh, was kicked off by some really impressive remarks by Dr. Ada Stewart, President of the American Academy of Family F Physicians. And in our first session, we looked at the shared principles of serious illness and primary care. And this provided an opportunity to have a crosswalk between the principles of primary care, such as team-based care, comprehensiveness, and patient-centeredness. Um, this was a really interesting discussion. Some of the co comments in the chat box um, really identified and highlighted some of the you know, challenges we have in nomenclature, um, issues in terms of professional silos. <clears throat> But also what was really important is it emphasised the importance of the individual's voice, the importance of individual stories and patient-centred care. In the second session, we really implemented some of those principles by looking at interdisciplinary teams in caring for people with serious illness. And we had a great opportunity to hear from people in real world settings um, and looking at a range of disciplines from uh, chaplaincy, nursing, uh, medicine. It was a really great session. I really encourage you if, you, if you missed the first session or you were there to take the time to go back and look at the recording. There's some really great 
um, discussion and some great examples to take us forward. And most importantly, I really want to thank you for um, taking the journey with us. Um, you know, this is a really crucial mission. We're dealing with some challenging issues. Um, and we are, there is obviously a really firm commitment, but how we implement these principles in policy and fund these important models of care is critically important. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, but now it's my really uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce Mike Olick. Mike Olick is living with multiple sclerosis and has been a volunteer with the National Patient Advocate Foundation for over seven years. Mike worked as a medical physicist until he became reliant on a wheelchair for mobility. In addition to being a volunteer with the National Patient Advocate Foundation, Mike is also involved in a number of advocacy efforts in the multiple sclerosis and disability communities. These are such critically important stories to inform our work. And so thank you, Mike, for being here with us today and also for sharing your story on video. And again, to everybody, thank you for journeying with us in having these crucial conversations to make care better for people living with serious illness. Thank you. When I was initially diagnosed, um, you know, it was something that I said, okay, this is going to make a change on things, but it's not necessarily going to be something that's going to be all encompassing and be everything and whatnot though. So here we are at this point though, 16 years later. And I would say very frankly, it's, you know, it is all encompassing. It is basically the only facet, honestly, for everything though, since I can't work professionally anymore. I always like to joke that I have you know, basically gone from a walker to a power, to a wheelchair, to a power wheelchair, et cetera. And it's become all encompassing though, with everything though. And it doesn't let me actually do anything anymore with regards to being who I was professionally though. So it still lets me be myself outside, but at the same time though, it, it's a, it's a rather all encompassing disease. So there's a lot of different aspects of it though. You know, I, I've seen several different specialists though. We've seen the primary care, we see the neurologist, we see, in my case, because of a lot of issues with bowel and bladder stuff, I have to see a, a neuro urologist as well too, physical therapist though. And it's hard because a lot of times what we're having to do is I'm responsible for my own care coordination though. And that's that's really the major issue, honestly, though, too. And um in saying that, the major problem is the fact that, you know, I have to coordinate everything, though. There's no overarching, though, in terms of, you know, overarching theme in terms of who's actually helping with everything. It's more or less I'm having to coordinate and manage and basically be the expert on my own care, number one, which I don't mind. But at the same time, though, you know, I don't necessarily know who to reach out to. And I'm coming from a perspective of I was in a healthcare, I was in the healthcare system for well over a decade professionally though and whatnot though. So I know personally how to reach out and stuff like that though. But at the same time though, most, the gross majority of patients are not going to know. And that's a major problem though, in terms of knowing how to actually get the help that you need to deal with X, Y, Z and whatnot though. And that's, that's kind of the coordination component of things. That's a major problem that I keep seeing. In my case, for example, I had to go out and reach out to somebody else who I did advocacy work with and she was able to refer me to a specialist though, who actually understood, okay, yeah, he's only in his early 40s. So we need to actually get this under control though, because that was one of the major problems that I saw from a patient-centric perspective with regards to, you know, the primary care doctor honestly would give me something for a script for something that was more intended for someone in their 60s or 70s who may not be on it for a very long duration. In my case, though, the major problem is I'm going to be on whatever it is for probably the next 20, 30 years, et cetera. So 
Um, I want to take the medication to get it under control right now. But at the same time, though, I want to see what holistically I can actually do to keep to better manage this myself in terms of, okay, if I lose some, if I lose some weight, if I can do these stretching exercises, what different things can I actually do to help me long term and not necessarily just be relying on this medication for the next 30 years? It was a balance and coordination thing in terms of um, my balance has always been exemplary, frankly, um, from ice hockey for years and years and years and whatnot, though. And all of a sudden, I couldn't skate anymore. Um, and it was so not something that was ever addressed, um, frankly, at any level, at either the primary care level or the neuro neurological level or anything else. Um, it was just kind of like, oh, well, it is what it is. Um, and it was something that was dropped. And it, it was something that, you know, to be honest, it, from a from a primary care perspective, it was been it, it should have been something. This is a major component of who I am, though, and it's a it's a relationship thing, um, in terms of if the patient has a good relationship with the primary care doctor, it would have been a conversation that probably would have come up and stuff like that, though. I used to be very active and whatnot though. And because of that, that was keeping my blood sugar under control. So, but because I'm not able to ambulate anymore at this point though, I'm having to go on diabetes medications and I completely get that. And I want to, I'm, I'm getting it under control with everything else with the A1C and the blood glucose and whatnot though. But at the same time, I don't know how this is going to impact me in 25, 30 years, honestly, if I'm continuing on these medications. So. I've personally gotten my weight under control and whatnot though and lowered my weight, but I still can't ambulate, you know, the way I need to, the way I used to exercise and things like that. That's what I need help with for my primary care in terms of what methodologies can I take? What kind of dietary steps can I take honestly to help basically better control everything and whatnot though? And that's not stuff that's actually brought up though at my age, honestly, though. It's basically, okay, well, we're just going to give you a pill. And the pill will help get everything under control. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. Let's get it under control. But then what long-term strategies, what can I do differently in the long-term though? Is there somebody I should talk to in terms of, you know, if you're, you're my primary care, let's go over a diet. Let's try your diet. If your diet doesn't work, let's go to a dietitian. If the dietitian doesn't work, let's go to somebody else though, actually, who can help me get this under control so I can actually be healthier overall and not just take more and more and more pills and things like that though um because we don't know what the long-term side effects actually are in a lot of these things and that's my that's that's my personal concern though so that's something that i've tried to emphasize with my personal primary care and whatnot though in terms of i'm going to do it but i want you to be open to the fact that how do we change this so this is not something that we have to do for the next 25 years in cancer centers you know, when I was in grad school, as well as also when I was working professionally, we would get together on a regular basis to coordinate for the patient, though, in terms of, okay, we're going to do a surg surgical oncology first, then we're going to do radiation, then we're going to do chemo, then we're going to do physical therapy, and then we're going to do palliative stuff, though, for figuring out, though, how to help be them best live their life at home. That's not something that we have when it comes to comprehensive care with multiple sclerosis or anything like that. You know, right now we subdivide things into four main types, um, relapsing, remitting, progressive, um, and clinically isolated syndrome. But what the, what the patient actually needs is not generally going to be something in terms of helping them live their life. Everything is very um, pigeonholed in terms of, okay, this is what you need right now. But is that going to be something that's going to help you live your best life long term, et cetera? Not necessarily. And, and in terms of we have to find a lot of things out on our own. Like in my particular case, I was originally using a, I was originally walking. I think I had to stop walking full time maybe six, seven years ago. And then I had to move to a power scooter. Um, but, and then I moved to a walker in the house and then eventually to a power chair manual wheelchair, et cetera. But each of those things I had to reach out for on my own in terms of coordinating everything and whatnot, though. There was no playbook to actually figure out how to actually go down that road, though. And 
it's it's really difficult though to be to be frank to figure out though what the best methodology is though in terms of what you're, obviously we don't know what the end goal is going to be and that's that's a positive thing we know that the gross majority of folks are not going to end up in a chair but at the same time though there should be some give and take and feedback though to actually make sure that people are actually getting the help that they need to actually get them both the devices that they need as well as okay is this medication working out for you um at this point i just from a medication perspective i've been through nine different um dmts disease modifying therapies and you know frankly if i wasn't my own advocate though in terms of going over my images to double check and make sure of everything you know i probably would be on number 2 or 3 frankly though at this point though and it would not have any efficacy whatsoever so and it's one of those things that it's hard because you want basically though from a primary care perspective them to be not necessarily a friend but to basically help you understand how to go through this and how to coordinate it though and that's really difficult to be frank though from a chronic disease perspective um and you want basically that relationship though to be able to talk and say what do i do with this and not just have to rely on basically the specialist but to be able to actually have the primary care doctor be not necessarily a friend but be able to help you understand the medical system and who you need to talk to about xyz thanks so much um mike for sharing your personal story and boy there were so many powerful messages there for us to hear in terms of supporting person-centered care for people living with serious illness. This is a great backdrop to further our conversations today, in particular to look at how we implement best practice models into care for everybody, just not for a few. And it's my, now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Rogers, uh, our coach, my co-chair for this session, um, who, for this roundtable rather, who's going to moderate this session. Um, and again, Mike, thanks so much. Mike is joining us today on vacation. Um, thanks for all you do uh, for others through your advocacy. And we hope that our efforts today and deliberations will address some of the important areas that you identified during your video. So thanks again, Mike. Over to you, Phil. Excellent. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, Mike. And thank you everyone for joining us today. It is, it is my pleasure and honor to, to open up session three, which focuses on the policy mechanisms to support person center care for, for people with serious illness in, in primary care settings. And I'm thrilled to be joined by a terrific set of speakers and panelists to, to help us explore this critical area of our workshop. We'll first hear from Dr. Arif Kamal, who's an associate professor of medicine at Duke University, who will take a brief but detailed look at the, 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 the the importance of quality measurement in serious illness care. We'll then hear from Ms. Amy Bassano, who is the Deputy Director at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation to talk about the substantial work in the innovation-centered portfolio that has been developed to address the needs of individuals with a serious illness. Um, we'll then transition to Megan Thompson, who's a Senior Policy Advisor uh, to Senator Jackie Rosen from the great state of Nevada, uh, who has been a champion for serious illness care in her work through caucuses and committees in the Senate. Um, and the, then we'll be joined by Drs. Kimberly Bauer and Adam Bard, who together in partnership through work at, at, at Blue Shield of California have begun to innovate in, in the commercial space for <laughs> helping create better models for care delivery and also payment. Um, there are more detailed bios for all of our speakers in, in, in your briefing book. Uh, and, and I hope you're, you are as excited as I am to hear from them. Um, each, as you heard, um, 
as mentioned at the top, and if you were with us last week, we've challenged each of our speakers to give us just 10 minutes of their expertise, and we thank them for, for sharing that with us, um, after which we will engage in a discussion that will include you, you, your questions. Uh, please, as you develop your questions, enter them in to the Q&A section of, of the Zoom. So without further ado, I would love, like to introduce Dr. Reef Kamal, who is our first speaker. Well, thanks, Phil, and uh, appreciate uh, being able to join such an austere group of uh, speakers. So I'm going to talk about quality of serious illness care integration in primary care. So uh, ne next slide, please, Caitlin. So I, I want to remind us that right now where we're at is an inflection point, both for healthcare and society. There has been nothing more transformative than a global pandemic than to remind us that quality of life is really important, regardless of whether we have a serious illness, take care of a loved one with a serious illness, or at risk of a serious illness. And nothing more than a pandemic can remind us that we're all uh, very short away from having a serious illness if we don't have one right now. And what that means is that we have to be very deliberate in our action and steps to take care of people who have them, um, to make sure that we honor people as people first and as patients second and to make sure that we're paying attention to caregivers and those and within the healthcare system whose primary focus is to take care of the people that they love. So next slide, please. So I, I wanna think about palliative care, not as uh, where we've started, which I'm gonna call sort of 1.0, but really an area we're coming upon, which is 3.0. And in this framework, I'm really sort of saying here that 1.0 was an awareness by health systems and society that patients and caregivers suffer, both from serious illnesses, but also going through the healthcare system itself. An awareness that focus on quality of life doesn't happen by accident, but happens because we focus on these needs, do meticulous assessments, and then put teams around these patients and their caregivers to make sure that we remain lockstep in with their values and priorities to meet the goals that they're after. Palliative Care 2.0 to me was about availability, in particular, looking at serious illness populations and making sure we have services, standards, guidelines, quality measures, and, and clinical delivery mechanisms that can meet the needs of these, of these populations. But importantly, now I think where we're at is on the cusp of 3.0. This is really transitioning from availability to accessibility. Availability is, I have a service. Accessibility is making sure the people who can benefit the most find these services and get regular interactions with them. Next slide, please. So in doing this, I think there's three areas of focus that I'm going to touch on. The first is the workforce to be able to provide this meticulous care. The second part is developing of quality measures, particularly in areas where we find that there are gaps. And third, then really activating the patient and caregiver voice so that they feel empowered to seek these services. Okay, next slide, please. So let me start with where we are as a specialty workforce. So I started by talking about palliative care as a specialty. And the bottom line here is we can't do this alone. We know that there's about 7,000 specialty palliative care physicians in the country and a numeral number of nurses, social workers, chaplains, pharmacists, and others as part of the team. But some work that we did and published in Health Affairs a few years ago demonstrated that we are actually entering into a chasm or a valley of the physician-specific workforce. Now, this data is physician-specific because we have uh, very little quantitative of data and other members of the healthcare team. But what this yellow box demonstrates is we'll actually have less palliative care physicians over the next 20 years than we do today. And that reflects both the age of the workforce itself, but also the increasing demand uh, as we find more and more people with serious illnesses and those who could benefit from our services. Next slide, please. What that ends up doing is, is really leading to a, a untenable uh, ratio between those who are eligible for palliative care. This is an example here from Medicare populations versus those physicians who are actually available. And what this underlines is, is that right now we may be at a ratio of uh, 14 uh, complex serious illness patients to be seen every single day by one palliative care physician, all the way up to 22 or 23 in a day. All that is a lot of fancy numbers to say this cannot be done alone. The care of patients with serious illness and their caregivers is a team sport, and we have to uh, embrace it as such. Next slide, please. So uh, myself and other colleagues recently published this idea that we have to embrace all members of the healthcare team as being palliative care uh, experts and specialists and those dedicated to the delivery of these services. And so here's a very simple framework, just saying that 
everyone, every single member of the healthcare team delivers basic or fundamental palliative care. That means focusing on every person as an individual, recognizing that they have threats to their healthcare quality of life, and putting a plan in place to, to help them with that. The second stage here is champions, and this is primary care physicians, hospitalists, intensivists, oncologists, et cetera, everyone else who's interested in providing some additional layers of support to patients, recognizing that uh, areas of distress can come from lot, lots of different sources, and complexity is, is the name of the game in, in this space. And lastly, is the specialists here at the top. This is the smallest workforce. These are the folks who've done additional fellowship training, et cetera. But what this graph shows is that we have to recognize and embrace and acknowledge the champion workforce here in the middle so that all patients eligible for this type of serious illness care are actually receiving it. Next slide, please. So as we know, as we shift over to quality of serious illness care delivery, this uh, is sort of the, the beginning, a middle and end of where we uh, find lots of our guidance. So this is a clinical practice guidelines for quality palliative care. Many on this uh, um, call were supporters and have been supporters of this work. This is important to recognize that from the very beginning, now uh, for about 20 years, we've recognized that there are eight domains of quality palliative care delivery, not just by palliative care specialists, importantly, but for any patient with serious illness and their caregivers. And these, you know, go across the spectrum from structure and processes of care, this is what you have, to physical and other aspects of care, this is what you do. Importantly then to the outcomes, this is what you get. And importantly, what you see here is that we're not just talking about symptoms, but we're talking about people and the various layers of complexity in their lives, psychological, social, et cetera. Next slide, please. And Uptakes of this framework have also been used in the National Quality Forum, which has also developed a slightly different version of its framework. I'm trying to give you sort of a high level sense of where do we think quality measurement sure occurred. And here within the NQF, what you can see is that not only are we thinking about types of palliative care, that means sort of end of life care and, and putting this off to the side, but also taking chronic and curative care there too, thinking about settings of care, inpatient, outpatient, home and facilities, but also looking at putting the patient and the family caregiver at the center, thinking about all those eight domains, but also thinking about a few others, for example, financial and caregiver issues as well. We recognize that financial toxicity is a huge component of low quality of life for patients with serious illnesses. For example, we know that one third of patients with advanced cancer will use up their entire life savings or declare bankruptcy. And this is an untenable uh, setting. And, and as Alex talked about himself, these types of logistical complexities are not minor and start to bleed into every component of one's life and their sense of personhood. Next slide, please. So as we think about where these opportunities are, we, we did some work to take a look at, well, if we've got these eight domains, where do existing quality measures exist? And what I can show you here is very clearly, there's a lot in physical aspects of care and structural aspects of care. Where our opportunities continue to exist, for example, are how do we assess and, and uh, the quality of cultural sensitive serious illness care, for spiritual uh, appropriate serious illness care, for socially embracive spiritual uh, serious illness care. What we can see is here, there's single digit quality measures for anywhere, not just in payment programs, but anywhere in the literature. And these are huge opportunities for us to think about quality measure development to fill these gaps. Next slide, please. We're also thinking about expanded frameworks for quality measurement as well. So the classic is uh, structure process outcomes. This is the Don Abedian uh, work from the University of Michigan, and a great way to start thinking about this. But we've also thought and posed, well, what if we expand these criteria to think about other frameworks? For example, we've got structure process and health outcomes, but as we think about serious illness care, what about access, resource use, experience, costs, and overall uh, population health? So thinking about this at, at a broader scale. Next slide, please. Importantly, there is now really great work happening in the field, particularly in specialty palliative care. So the Palliative Care Quality Collaborative is the first national unified effort to collect structure process and outcomes data that's patient specific, uh, but also field relevant and organization informative to, to really improve the quality of care of palliative care delivery in a collaborative and learning centered type of way. And I encourage you all to go to palliativequality.org and take a look at what this organization is doing. It's been really fantastic to see them grow and really uh, 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 get into the field over the last uh, six months to a year. Next slide, please. I want to end by really talking about patient engagement. And as this um, uh, video starts to play here, 
Caitlin. Yeah. Um, we've been thinking here at Duke. So at Duke, we, we run a, a research program about create, creating patient facing digital health technologies to really uh, get people interested and excited about palliative care. And this is an example called um, Prepped the App. And this is uh, from my research group and spun out in a company that we co-founded called Prepped Health. And the idea here is to get patients and their caregivers through a question prompt list interested and activated uh, in engaging with palliative care services or home-based primary care services, et cetera. This is one example, Caitlin, if you can go to the next slide. PC for me uh, is another app that we've developed to introduce patients to outpatient palliative care. Uh, that's this here. Uh, and then one more slide will be our HOPE app. Um, sorry, one more slide will be our HOPE app. And this is our app to introduce patients with serious illness to hospice and other type of home-based uh, care services like home health care and bridge type services as well. So I'll just end there with my last slide and say that I really think these are these three areas of focus. We have to have patients and family members be those who engage and ask for these types of services. That's really important, but also think about the quality measurement gaps that we face today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Cabal, and I, I can't think of a better way to kick off the session than first with Mike's comment about his his his, his experience and then this framework that you've set forth uh, for us um, around the idea of workforce, which really underguards the entire workshop. Um, of course, what quality means in an expansive forward looking way, and then, then really uh, keeping the patient and caregiver both at the center of our work and also activated. Um, and, 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 and I know that those priorities also align with the excellent work that's being done at the Innovation Center. So it's my pleasure next uh, to invite Ms. Amy Bassano, uh, who is the Deputy Director and has been intimately involved in their work in the serious illness space uh, to, to share that work with us. Amy. Thanks, Phil, and appreciate you uh, inviting me here today. I'm glad to be on the panel and speaking with you all this afternoon. Um, next slide, please. As uh, Phil said, I'm the Deputy Director of the Innovation Center at CMS. And the Innovation Center created you know, 10 plus years ago as part of the Affordable Care Act. And our charge is to test alternative payment models of looking at different ways to pay for care, improve incentives, be more patient-centered, um, and you know, reducing costs and improving quality. And since the beginning of our time, looking at patients with advanced, uh, with serious illness, advanced care, and primary care has been one of our charges um, and something that has been a very high priority for us. Next slide, please. And so over this period of time, um, I'll talk about a few of our different models where it really touches on it. We've, uh, it's really an evolution or um, an iterative process of how we work through this and work very closely with the stakeholders and partners. Um, many of you all have been very helpful to us as we have tested these different models and thought about how to get this. This slide here just talks about some of the lessons learned as we've been reflecting on our um, 10 year anniversary about how we approach some of these in, in aggregate across our models, really trying the um, more upfront payments and limited risk for, um, for our participants, generally you know, different types of providers. But now as we've gained more experience, you know, really making sure we're also focusing on the quality end of things and that um, you know, shared savings, meaning there's financial risk, but opportunities in total cost of care. But also I think for our conversation today, where we say here, the integration of clinical treatment and social services is a really important approach that we are continuing to um, push on as we, as we go forward. Um, next slide, please. And so just here, I'll, I'll run through some of our uh, particular models. Our comprehensive primary care plus models actually was our second uh, primary care initiative, but really um, building upon earlier lessons, um, looking to increase um, primary care services, um, integration of different types of services and having the primary care practice as sort of at the center of the, the, the patient's care. Um, you'll be hearing from some other payers, but this is a really important model for us in primary care because we all of our primary care models have been multi-payer, really trying to align all those incentives for the practices to do take this on this transformation. And um, you know, with everyone in their community, all their, their other payers sort of aligning with them. And so um, CPC and then CPC Plus, which is um, ending this year, have all done that and tried to um, modify some of the payment uh, uh, adjustments uh, so that you know moving away 
from fee for service and looking to you know make sure there's better incentives to take care of patients with serious illness and get them and refer them to the to the services they need. Um, next slide, please. And um, doing it uh, most explicitly now in our primary care first model, which is sort of our, our third iteration of primary care. This model started um, earlier this year, and we have uh, explicit. Um, it's sort of a um, uh, explicit uh, version for high needs um, populations here, making sure, again, the incentives are aligned and that the, the financial and quality measures are really looking at, you know, how to make sure these the, the patients with serious illness, with complex needs are um, taken care of appropriately in a very, you know, patient-centered, person-centered um, manner. Um, and so we'll uh, continue to build out this model, have other um, practices coming in for next year. Um, and then um, we do have a, a serious illness track of that, um, which we have not implemented to date due to a number of um, operational reasons. And this is something, as we all think through these issues, of how do we identify these patients. These are for patients who are demonstrated high needs of care, but really uncoordinated care. And as we, um, we CMS, think about um, coordinating and connecting them to, uh, to our um, providers who could uh, be um, uh, provider groups or sorry, physicians or hospices, palliative care. And there's been great interest in this model, but we're coming across or bumping up some issues about how do we reach out to those patients? They have no one who's coordinating their care, but given some of the protections, HIPAA protections and other beneficiary protections in the program, we can't reach out to them. We can't have third parties reach out to them. So working through some of those operational issues right now, hoping to be able to get that uh, phase of the model up off the ground um, in the you know in the near term as well, and uh, think how we work work through that. Now, next slide, please. Uh, so direct contracting is our um, one of our other newest models as well, sort of building off of the. Um, uh, the ACO space, so the successor to our, in some ways, to our next generation ACO model. Again, more financial risk, more um, flexibility in terms of payments, uh, the way we pay and looking across um, uh, Medicare, you know, parts A and B. I think the important thing here to note is that there is a high needs track. Uh, we have six participants who've come into this looking at patients, often dual eligibles, and others who are really stronger, you know, higher needs, need more complex um, care. And so we've dedicated that track as it's, it's, you know, appropriate risk adjustment and other uh, payment methodologies to go along with it. And so um, we've had uh, six participants, six uh, direct contracting entities come in with us. I think they have a footprint across 12 states. And as we bring our second cohort in next year, looking to expand upon that as well. So multiple different opportunities going on here and looking for that, that integration, really for making sure we have um, the incentives for the providers to be you know, taking care of these patients in this way. Next slide, please. And then um, one of our older models or Medicare Care Choices model looked really more at the specifically the hospice eligible population and providing them with palliative care as well, or not having to make the choice. They can continue to get their concurrent, what we call concurrent care, you know, get their um, any type of uh, curative therapy and palliative care services. Um, and this uh, model is coming to an end this year, but really our first sort of dabble in this area um, limited participation and limited by the hospices, but also limited conditions that we were looking at. And we've learned a lot in this model that there have been the most recent evaluation report was showing um, pretty successful findings in terms of savings, but it was not really generalizable given the, the limited number of participants and hospices that were participating. But I think this really has set us up well for what comes next. What are we doing next in our services? You know, how do we build upon this model and the other efforts? And some of the key questions are, what should these models be? Um, standalone models like MCCM, where here's your a palliative care model that is the participants and patients in that are all looking at it, or should it be embedded more like the direct contracting within a broader total contact um, total cost of care model. And I forgot to mention in the direct contracting model, we actually have waivers that are allowing this um, 
these um, concurrent care to happen as well there. So hospitable patients in that model can also get the same services from MCCM so they can continue to get their curative care and palliative care services under that. And so as we think about that, and you know, we're going through our, our work and we're calling a strategy refresh now, what do these next models look like and how do we keep building off of those lessons learned? Um, next slide, please. And then lastly here, I um, talking about Medicare Advantage where we know growing part of the uh, Medicare population, you know, large percentages are now in Medicare Advantage plans, but um, Prior to our model here, um, if you were hospice, needed hospice services, you had to disenroll from Medicare Advantage. And we, um, so now we are testing in this model, how did, what if you stayed in Medicare Advantage and got your hospice services there, really trying to make sure there's better coordinated of care, that you're not at this really fragile, delicate point where you're, you know, having to change providers, having to change, you know, your insurance, and that, you know, if you've been an MA for a while, you know, want to, you know, can you continue to stay there and can they continue, to, can you, they offer you a better coordinated care, better serving your needs. And so this model um, started earlier this year, testing this out. It's a relatively small um, um, footprint to start. And so you'll see there are 14 um, MAOs in 30 states in Puerto Rico, um, but we're expecting to um, roll this, I'm sorry, for the expand this in the in uh, current uh, next year as we've had you know, more applications, uh, a pop opportunity to come into this model. We've also been very carefully watching the implementation of this because of concerns that um, uh, people have raised about, you know, what, you know, what are the MA, are they going to not provide access, or are they going to have issues getting these services or prior authorization? And so we're working very closely with the hospices and the um, plans to make sure that's going smoothly. And, and to date, you know, I say it's early, we, it has been relatively smooth. And I think there's been a lot of um, collaboration between the hospices and the um, MA plans uh, on how to make this work, given the vulnerability of these patients. And so as we think about, um, as I said, sort of what comes next on our models, you know, how do we continue to push this? How um, do we continue to develop models that are really serving these patients? And especially, you know, with a continued focus on being patient-centered, person-centered, how are we addressing um, disparities and health equity? And how do we um, want to take upon the lessons learned both from um, our previous models, but what our partners, other payers, providers are doing and how the um, just the, the science and thinking around this area continues to evolve. So that is sort of our charge of what we are um, working on and love to hear feedback about people, you know, from anyone who think, has ideas for us on how we can integrate that, you know, what are the appropriate um, challenges? And then one of the big questions is, and uh, is about, um, you know, how do you, you know, what are the right uh, conditions? When do you um, look at this? Um, for you know, hospice eligible versus more upstream. And then one of the big questions, of course, is the dementia and Alzheimer's, even putting aside the new drug coming in, but how do we make sure those patients are most um, appropriately incorporated? Because we have not quite had them in, in a model yet. But um, so we've got lots uh, more to come and look forward to uh, hearing uh, people's questions and taking their comments. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And I just want to sort of acknowledge the substantial work under your leadership and with the, the, the kind of focus of the Innovation Center to sort of get these models in place and understanding that every opportunity is an opportunity to learn. I look forward to our discussion and getting engagement from our participants today to dive a little deeper. And that does give me the opportunity to make sure and invite all of our participants to enter your questions into the Q&A portion of the Zoom. Please. Start now, we're, we're, we're gonna keep a rolling tally of those uh, and help them guide and shape our group discussion. Um, and with that, we will uh, invite Megan Thompson to join us. Uh, as I mentioned at the top and is available to you in your briefing book, uh, Ms. Thompson's a senior policy advisor to Senator Rosen and has uh, graciously agreed to share uh, her view from the Hill on, on on, on, on integrating serious illness care into primary care. Megan? Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, just let me know if anything doesn't come clear with uh, with video or sound, but it's an honor to be part of this panel. 
Again, my name is Megan Thompson. I serve as a senior policy advisor for Senator Jackie Rosen from Nevada and focus primarily on health care and child welfare. So Senator Rosen serves on the aging committee, also the health committee, which is health, education, labor, and pensions. And she also founded and co-chairs the Senate Comprehensive Care Caucus, uh, which is a bipartisan group that she started um, based out of her own experiences, which I'll talk about a little more in a minute. Um, but this caucus focuses on three main areas, palliative care, care coordination, and support for caregivers. And going back to her experience, she talks quite a bit about why she's so passionate here. And she was the caregiver for both her parents and her in-laws at the ends of their lives. And, and this kind of overlapped. She took a step back from her career um, for a little over a year and went through pretty much every care setting and, and scenario you could think of and feels so strongly that patients and their families should have access to some of the things that um, she wasn't able to access um, and then some of the things that did help. And so you know, that need for comprehensive care, I think, for treating the whole patient ties in so well with the theme of the panel today and, and what we've already heard from some of the other panelists. So when we look at this from a policy perspective and improving care for people with serious illness, you know, how, where do we start? How do we break that down? So for um, the, the first area that I'm gonna talk about is about patients having access to the type of care they need, when they need it, and where they can actually get it. So when we look at Nevada, uh, for example, in many parts of our state, you might need a certain type of specialty care and you can start driving four hours and hours and still not be able to get to where you need to go, um, much less have the ability to, um, you know, to get there. And so as we started talking with a number of physicians in our state and community health centers, we wanted to figure out what would really help, not only for the clinical piece, but what about for our providers that were in those underserved areas? We wanted to keep them there. And we, we wanted to make sure that they had more colleagues going out there as well. So this led to the Improving Access to Healthcare and Rural and Underserved Areas Act. Uh, this Congress, it's S-201, which Senator Rosen introduced with Senator Murkowski. It's a bipartisan bill. And what we heard from our physicians in the state was about the need for access to specialists, but also this need for the ongoing medical training opportunities that really fit their particular needs to serve the most vulnerable um, of their patients. This came up in um, talking about, okay, maybe I'll refer out, you know, we heard from the physicians, for something that might have been within their scope, but it had been a really long time since they trained in a particular area um, and they felt more comfortable. Just we'll have a specialist deal with that, except that specialist might not even be in Nevada. So this bill has two parts. The first part funds specialists um, through grants with community health centers and rural health clinics um, based on the needs that they identify. So it could be endocrinology, infectious disease, palliative care, uh, a pediatric subspecialty, just depending on the needs of their patients. So the specialists come to the health center or clinic. Uh, we have designed this to be allowed virtually or in person, depending on um, both logistics and um, situation like with COVID, um, and do concurrent visits. So the patient would meet with both their primary care provider and the specialist within that same care visit. So the patient is really getting a full experience and the primary care provider is able to learn um, during that visit as well. So for example, you might have some diabetic patients that just aren't getting their sugar under control. So in that scenario, you might have an endocrinologist that joins a visit that talks through maybe the latest medications or other modifications that might help the patient. But the other half is on specific peer-to-peer -peer education, but that is accredited to count as continuing medical education and designed by those that are receiving it. So it's not us telling them, hey, you need to learn X, Y, or Z. It's the health centers and clinics saying, this is the area that we want to be able to focus on and it's funded 
through um, a design that is really going to be beneficial um, is our hope and, and be productive for both the providers and their patients. And, um, you know, our, our hope is that this really helps improve the patient care, helps support our providers in these underserved areas, and, and gives them the support that helps draw in others to those communities. And so that is the piece that we're focusing on and how to actually improve the access to specialty care in a way that starts to integrate it into your primary care setting. Um, but the other part that I wanna to touch on is on palliative care. This is a really important thing for Senator Rosen. Um, and the way she talks about it and her long-term goal, a lot of the work we do is really getting palliative care earlier in the process that, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, and, and I think broader in the community think, oh, palliative care hospice, which is wonderful and amazing. And, and we really value those services, but that's just a piece of it at the end of life. And so Senator has been working to educate her colleagues about the need to just as close as possible to the time of diagnosis of serious illness or injury um, we've been adding in the injury language as well. Um, think about a, a burn victim, something like that. You really need wraparound care. Um, and so a few things in this space. Uh, last year, she uh, was successfully led a bipartisan resolution that recognized November as a National Hospice and Palliative Care Month. And I note this where it was bipartisan. It passed by unanimous consent, but it also included mention of palliative care being complementary to curative treatments and recognizing the benefits that integrating palliative care early into the treatment plans for patients with serious illness or injury. And this is something that um, is a little bit of a shift that we were really pleased to see such um, unification within the Senate on this type of language and recognizing the value of palliative care and what that really means for patients. And uh, so on that, we are currently working on two additional bills that um, are nearing uh, introduction, but not, not quite there yet, uh, focusing on improving palliative care for um, seniors within Medicare. So I'm building on um, what CMS has been doing, looking at community-based palliative care and really allowing that access as close to the time of diagnosis as possible and really working that in. So you know, hopefully for many patients, they may recover the curative treatments may work, but um, by adding the palliative, you're gonna improve quality of life. And also what we're seeing some data um, with cancer patients is you're doing better. The outcomes are also um, improved for some, which is great. And the other bill that we're working on touches um, on breaking down some barriers for those who rely on transfusions. So this could be um, those with leukemias, lymphomas, um, sickle cell, um, don't often opt into hospice. And so we're looking at being able to carve out the um, payment for transfusions to make sure that they have access to those uh, hospice benefits as well. So again, I look forward to our discussion and uh, participating in answering any additional questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Megan, and really uh, appreciate you taking the time and your offices and also Senator Rosen's leadership in Ella dating the profile of, of, of the needs of patients and specifically seniors, Medicare beneficiaries with serious illness, uh, and look forward to, to kind of um, exploring that more deeply in our discussion. So it is next my honor to welcome to our Zoom, uh, Drs. Kim Bard, Bauer and Adam Bard. Um, we kind of spent time in the middle of our session here talking about what, what, what's happening in the CMS and Medicare space and in the so sort of uh, uh, pieces of the system over which Congress has authority. We're now going to shift to the work being done in the commercial and, and Medicare Advantage space that, that uh, 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 Amy began to reference in her comments um, by our colleagues who are innovating in California. California. So without further ado, I will hand things off to Kim and Adam.
Thank you, Phil. Good morning and good afternoon to folks all over the country and even beyond. We're going to, Dr. Uh, Kim Bauer and I are going to speak a bit about how Blue Shield of California is incorporating palliative care and serious disease management into primary care. Next slide, please. We know that today's healthcare system is overwhelmed by unsustainable costs, patient and provider dissatisfaction, the need to improve and incentivize health outcomes. And we know that individuals and employers are spending much more each year to get to, to this point. And the system is overrun with in inequities. And Blue Shield wants to lead this effort to transform healthcare. And we're doing so, and we're beginning by transforming primary care. By doing so, we know we will better meet the needs of people with serious illness, and, and that requires an investment in primary care to provide time for physicians to have a shared decision-making experience with their patients, to incorporate community integrated health services, and incorporate and improve palliative care into the care delivery model. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about the, the, the shift and the overall process of how health needs to, how healthcare needs to transform. And if you look at the model here, the sort of 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 model, going from a sick care system to this community integrated health system, we're, we're not quite there yet. We're, we're still in this um, time period where we're trying to better coordinate within the existing system. So this really has driven Blue Shield to look at not the triple aim, not the quadruple aim, but the quintuple aim. And, and rather than going through each of these today, just because of the short amount of time that we have, you can see that we are very much trying to improve the experience of both providers and patients and also increase health equity. And we believe that it is our job to relentlessly pursue fundamental changes in how healthcare is delivered. Next slide, please. So Health Reimagine, which is our answer to transforming healthcare, includes many different solutions. And this is just an example of four that we believe put together can help to advance this, tran this transformative process. And so you can see here that it's shared decision-making, virtual care, community health advocates, and real-time claims settlements. I wanna focus just for a second, a very brief second on shared decision-making um, because shared decision-making and the tools that are within those different platforms um, improve patient engagement and satisfaction by encouraging a deeper discussion about healthcare, serious illness, and certainly palliative care um, to develop advanced care plans. Next slide, please. Now to do so, we believe as a payer, but also as part of the healthcare system, that we need to begin by supporting primary care in a new way. And to do so, we have developed some innovative payment models. Uh, this example here uh, is a payment model that includes a pay for value per member per month or per patient per, per month payment to support key activities that occur during and outside of a traditional office visit, including things like referrals and testing, um, uh, uh, support to find, uh, as we heard er earlier, uh, to support and find home-based palliative care, a proactive outreach to other clinical home and community-based clinical services, which could include coordination of care with a home-based palliative care team. And other things like connecting with our health, with the health advocate, transitions of care um, to Im improve support and management, proactive outreach to patients to encourage them to obtain tests, follow up after tests, um, establish accurate diagnoses, uh, or make the proper follow-ups as needed based on those results. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Bauer, who's gonna share a bit more about how palliative care interfaces with this new primary care model at Blue Shield of California. 
All okay. right, thanks so much, Adam. And there we go. So I'm gonna start look by looking at the continuum of palliative care. And the healthcare reimagined or the primary care reimagined model that Adam just talked about, that is really designed to help primary care doctors move away from this pay for volume to a pay for value system where they have the time and space to deliver primary level palliative care in their office. So symptom management and time to discuss goals of care and advanced care planning. Now, when the primary care doctor needs help from a specialist, we want them to be able to refer to clinic-based palliative care. And this is a place where we know that we really have a problem with access. And I think it's largely because we're not paying for that interdisciplinary team that really is essential to the provision of palliative care. A doctor or a clinician, a provider can build their normal CPP codes for a consultation, but they don't have that full um, support of team-based palliative care. And then when members really need or patients need care in the home, Blue Shield has put together a payment model for pre-hospice home-based palliative care. And this is where I'm gonna spend most of my time today is talking about this model. All right, next slide. So when a primary care doctor needs an extension into the home, needs to be able to um, extend their care in the home, we want palliative care, this home-based team to be that extension. So if a member or a patient has functional limitations, has trouble getting into the primary care doctor's office, if there are social determinants that are interfering with the continuity of their care, or if they just have really complex um, regimens that they need to follow um, to manage their chronic disease or their serious illness, um, and they can't quite figure out how to do that, sometimes in the office setting you can't figure it out and you need somebody in the home to really look at what are the barriers for the patient, what needs to be put in place to support them so that they can be successful in their treatment. So these are times when we want to have that home-based palliative care um, uh, available. Next slide. So to qualify for our home-based palliative care program, you need to have a serious illness. And then the provider has to say that they wouldn't be surprised if the member died in the next year. So, you know, the current eligibility criteria are still tied to prognosis, just like um, the hospice model is. And next slide. Once admitted to the home-based palliative care program, the member gets the sort of the standard palliative care services. And I just want to highlight that all of our um, providers are required to have a medical director. They have to be able to do physician and MP consultation in the home. The team has to include a spiritual counselor and they have to provide 24-7 uh, uh, telephonic support. And for these services, they're paid um, a per enrolled member per month case rate, so just a flat, case rate um, for each member that's on the program each month. And we don't want members to be disincentivized from enrolling in the program, so there's no copay for the member. Okay, next slide. What are the results? What are the early results? Well, we have been able to establish a um, statewide network of palliative care providers. Um, almost everywhere we can go and do actual in-home care. In some of the rural areas, we're still needing to do telemedicine or remote care. The program started in 2017, and we've had 3,064 members enrolled in the program, which when I initially look at it, looks like a big number, but Blue Shield has 3.5 million members across the state. And so given that, that number of members, this is still a pretty small number of enrolled members. And one of our big barriers is getting referrals into the palliative care programs. About a third of the referrals come from our primary care providers. A third come from a vendor that we hire to engage patients. And a third come from other settings like the hospital or our um, case management programs. In terms of quality data, about 52% of members on the program have completed an advanced directive and 90% have designated a durable power of attorney for healthcare. One of the metrics that's not on the slide is when members come into the program, what happens to them? And interestingly, what we find is about 20% of them go to hospice, 10% of them die in the program, and 70% of them actually stabilize and for a period of time come off of the home-based palliative care program or they change insurance or they have a different reason for coming off the program. When we look at utilization, we do see decreased ED and hospital utilization, which is great, 
We want serious illness well managed and we don't want people having to go into the ED and hospital. Most of the cost savings that we achieve from that is we invested into the program. So it, 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 it supports the payments for our providers and the administrative costs of the program. And finally, we just started sending out patient satisfaction surveys and we've had about 50 back. Um, the majority of them are satisfied or very satisfied. And where we get negative comments, is a, it's about things that aren't included in the palliative care pro, um, package, like people want a home health aid or they want shift care nursing or something like that. Of note, what is not included on this slide is the um, provider satisfaction. So we know that it's really important that the primary care provider does feel like the palliative care program is an extension of their care. In integrated health systems where the palliative care provider is a part of that health system, this often works pretty well and communication is good. But in most of our models, we have the primary care doctor and then we have sort of a freestanding community-based organization that's providing the palliative care. And we need to, I think, find ways to improve relationships and communication between the primary care provider and the palliative care provider. Next slide. So finally, what are the future directions? One, we really think that there's a gap in palliative care right now, which is that being able to provide that clinic-based palliative care. So we're working on payment models that will um, provide um, a case rate along with a value-based incentive and um, payments for that interdisciplinary palliative care team. We also think that we need to support our primary care doctors and share decision-making by giving them extra time with patients, but also through cloud-based tools that help prepare them for conversations with their provider. And so in palliative care, these are around advanced care planning and the tools let patients think about their decisions and start putting in writing or just thinking about what are my personal preferences? What do I want my doctor to know about me? And finally, as we move toward pay for value in primary care and away from pay for volume, we really feel that integration of palliative care into the care delivery model is gonna be a key to making these models successful. And so um, that is where I will end, thank you. Excellent, thank you to Kim and Adam and thank you to all of our presenters. We, we issued them an incredible challenge, which is to give us you know, substantive complex content in a short period of time. And I have to say, all of your presentations have exceeded our expectations, so thank you. Um, at this point, um, I would invite all of our speakers for session three to turn on their camera and their mic so we can transition to our discussion and Q&A. And I wanna thank those of you who have already entered questions and a few comments into chat, keep those coming uh, th th throughout the next half an hour or so uh, of, of our discussion and Q&A. So I'd like to start things off um, actually with Mike, uh, really, uh, really inspired and uh, kind of challenged and felt at times even a little implicated by your comments, which I, I, I think is important for all of us to acknowledge together. And what, what, what I'd love to ask you is if you could change two or three things about the systems and teams uh, and, and ways in which you've interacted with, with your healthcare um, providers, two or three things that you, you would change to make the experience more patient-centered, uh, more responsive to your needs, what would those two or three things be? I don't know if I have three things, but I'll say what initially comes to mind right away um, is with regards to what can I do actually to make a difference in my own personal life in terms of what, you know, what exercises can I do at home, what stretching type things, and also what type of dietary changes and whatnot though. You know, because right now what everything is happening when I go to my primary cares and whatnot though, is everything is being referred to a specialist though for more exacting nomenclature and whatnot though. And realistically, it's some of these things I know do need to go to a specialist. I have, I have no question since I have a very aggressive course with multiple sclerosis and integrated in my spine and everything. Um, but at the same time though, with some of these things, I'm more or less just trying to get some more holistic. Not, when I say holistic, I don't mean the, the new age philosophy. I just mean the more comprehensive component of 
what can I do basically to manage um, my own health actually outside of just the multiple sclerosis? Because as I said, I've been through nine medications and I I'm just trying to figure out though, yeah, those are very aggressive medications, but they're not the only component of me though. I want to figure out though, how do I keep my blood sugar under control? How do I keep my weight under control? How do I keep all those things under control? And I think that's something that I I'd much rather have a more open conversation with, with my primary care and not have to be, like I said, I'm, I'm coming from a, um, from a clinical background though. So I, I kind of know how to talk to them and I know how to reach out and whatnot though. But I know, my, like I said, the, the gross majority of patients who I know personally and whatnot though don't know how to do that. So I think the conversation has to be started from the primary care end about what the end goals are for a lot of things. Thank you for that. And you know, I would actually tie that back to some of our discussion in our first workshop session last week. I, you know, the, the vision for the shared principles of primary care and palliative care is, is, is to provide that comprehensive, but that's the word I think you got to there, uh, sort of support for patients by clinicians and teams who know them. And it isn't that right. we expect our our primary care teams to know everything and not need help from specialists, but we really be that coordinating hub. And it sounds like we have work to do to achieve that vision that we have for ourselves and also that you deserve as, as someone seeking care. Thank you for that. And, and as I'm th thinking about that, maybe I'll turn next to Megan. I was, I was so very interested to hear the, the um, work you're doing and the legislation you're be be beginning to craft that envisions a concurrent model of care between primary care and specialty care. And it occurs to me that that may be one of the mechanisms by which we could start to kind of fill these gaps. I want to hear more maybe about that work and where it came from and where you see it going. Sure. Thank you so much. So this started um, actually when I moved into Senator Rosen's office. We have so many shortages of providers in Nevada, all providers, so doctors, nurses, medical assistants. Um, so we were looking at what can we do that really helps fill in some of those gaps in clinical care. And we started some roundtables just with a mix of state and, um, and national groups and individual doctors and asked them, what do you need? One, to be supported. So if you're already in an underserved area, we want you to stay. Uh, but two, where are the gaps? And this is something Senator Rosen talks about a lot. She wants to make sure what she's doing is actually what you need, not just what we think sounds nice. And so this was developed taking their feedback and working closely with one of the medical directors for a health center and kind of came up with this hybrid that specialty care just is not available to the degree that patients need. So what if we bring it to them? And with that, we heard you know, from um, different physicians that, hey, you know, for dermatology was an example that brought up that um, I wouldn't have thought on, on my own. And they said, we probably, I refer patients. This was a doctor telling us, I refer patients that I, I probably could see, but it's been a while. I just want to be sure. You know, and this was something, a, a provider that I have immense respect for. And I thought, wow, that's a really good point. If the last time you dealt with a certain type of case, was when you were in med school or residency, you know, it had been a while. You want to make sure you have the professional backup for that. And so that through that example, we thought about well, what if you got additional training for those types of things that you're seeing in your community and your patients are coming to you? They said, oh yeah, that that helps. Then that continuing education if it's to the degree that they could treat themselves, they could go ahead and do that. And um, so we're thinking long-term what this will do will not only improve direct access when specialty care is, is actually what is needed, but enhancing that primary care, um, not the scope, because we're staying within, I mean, family providers are, are a specialty unto their own. They're so well-trained, but trying to help provide them with the professional support they need to stay current on whatever their changing community needs are, because it's not static either, and having that support in a steady stream. And I've gotten questions before, I'll touch briefly, um, with Project ECHO is a similar model, but different. So this brings in the direct patient care. So the patient experiences, I'm seeing a specialist and my provider at the same time. 
And then we're looking at this to dovetail nicely with Project Echo, which is simply the peer-to-peer -peer kind of consultation. And with this program, we go a step further to where it's actual accredited continuing medical education, but that is um, directly responsive to what those community needs are. Thank you for sharing that vision. I, I, I think there's a lot in there that resonates with all of us. Uh, that's the kind of care we would like to deliver. Of course, that's the kind of care that we would expect for ourselves and those who we love. And you know, one, one of the things that occurred to us throughout the planning process is that as we think to, to sort of uh, approach a question as kind of complex and important as this, um, we're not going to have one solution or two solutions. We're going to have a portfolio of solutions that are responsive to different communities and different clinical scenarios. So thank you for that. Um, thank you all for your questions in the chat. Lots of um, uh, comments and questions as we expected around this shift towards value-based care and delivery and payment. Of course, that's central to the work of both the Innovation Center and also is featured prominently by our uh, um, by uh, Kim and Adam. Um, would want to just kind of um, putting a couple of those questions together. Can you speak a little bit about the key challenges that you've had? I'm, I'm going to first ask this of Amy and then of Kim and Adam together. Um, if uh, the key challenges you've had in trying to kind of implement these models and to think about how to design them. And maybe I'll borrow a bit of the question structure from Mike up front. If you could wave a magic wand and fix, you know, two or three key naughty problems, what, what would those be? And maybe, maybe I'll, I'll let, invite Amy to, to, to answer that first. Sure, thank you. So a couple things. One, we have a statutory framework to work within. So we need to be expecting that the model is going to be saving money and or improving quality. So trying to design a program um, that's going to, that we think on the outside is going to meet that. So there's often a lot of requests for sort of either upfront front funding or infrastructure payments or things like that that make it harder to do that we know could be make things easier as we try to attract a variety of participants into our models and that not everyone is in the same place. And so when we have these voluntary models, we look at, you know, looking at selection effects. And um, so how we balance all of that is always a challenge. You know, how much money can we pay for these services? In re, you know, what we expect the savings to be? How do we attract uh, a variety of different um, participants to the model? And then how we have a statutory requirement to do an evaluation of the model as well. So how do we design the? It's as a test, a demonstration that we will be able to evaluate it and to evaluate all of those key components within the particular period of time, which can be challenging, especially when looking at sort of the patient population of, you know, how do you know, how do you determine who's eligible? You know, we've used the, the six months hospice eligibility. Kim and Adam talked about using the physician. Do you think you'll be, you know, the next 12 months will pass away. We've talked about that, you know, how do you measure all of those and how do you determine the eligibility are all tricky things to all, all balance together. So, um, those are some of the, the challenges we have when designing the models. And then also, as we've had models proliferate, we run 40 plus models. How do you, you know, differentiate where one ends and where one begins and not to have so many different interventions, especially if we are, we are trying to, to test them and, and to be able to isolate those, those impacts? Thank you for that. You know, I think one of the um, themes I saw there were a lot, a lot of your structure is statutorily sort of required. And, you know, as we think together about how we can make progress, if we can make progress in that, that's something that we can think together with uh, leaders like Senator Rosen on how, how to make uh, that case. I, I do feel a particular issue of uh, trying to prove that a model can save money before you test it uh, can, can be a challenge. And I appreciate all the work that your team has done to try to work mm -hmm. on that. Uh, maybe it's to think a little bit um, just to Turning to our our, our uh, colleagues from Blue Shield California, who are perhaps not as statutorily constrained, but are you know have some 
fiduciary constraints. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you thought about how you, you provided that up for investment. I was really impressed with the early findings from your home-based palliative care uh, uh, model and kind of how you kind of made the case internally to make that investment up front, understanding that it was the right thing to do for your patients to get them access to these services before they would have been traditionally eligible for hospice. So I'd love to hear a bit more about how that came to be. Adam, do you want to start? Uh, sure, sure. I, I was going to take a little bit of a, of a step backwards, which actually might work really well, Kim, and then we can, I'll kind of ha hand it off to you. One of the things when we developed, when we started to discuss um, a different kind of payment model, um, not just for primary care, we, we've got many in specialty medicine as well, but was with the idea that we needed to allow physicians uh, and providers in general to practice medicine as they were trained to do. And as Kim said, we wanted to move away from a volume-based throughput model into this value-based model um, to provide time for providers to engage in these di discussions. Now, two of our biggest challenges. Um, one is even internally, we also want to do and have an evaluation period to understand the ROI or the SROI of our payment models or any of the solutions that we um, implement with the providers. And we also want any solutions that we develop or incorporate to provide additive value to the payment model. To, to support the payment model um, in a different way. But two challenges are physician adoption, which I think if we really dig in, has a lot to do with trust of payers in the market. And especially smaller independent physicians or small medical groups or IPAs still see a bit of distrust. And we understand why um, with Blue Shield and, and other payers. What that has led to also is that we as Blue Shield of California are implementing a payment model, maybe only for one line of business because of regulatory constraints. And so it may be a small subset of the patients in a practice, which makes adoption of the payment model more challenging because it's only for the small subset of patients. So if I could wave a magic wand, one mm -hmm. of the things I'd like to do is to be able to influence, and I'm a little biased, I also come from the provider side of the industry, so I'm very provider and patient focused, um, which is why I joined the team at Blue Shield was to hopefully be as transformative as I could, um, is to have all payers become part of these models um, in a way that would allow providers to not focus on, is it a Blue Shield patient or is it another payer patient, but in a way that they can modify their practice practices uh, for all patients and to really change their workflows to match the incentives, to match the quality um, and to match the collaboration that we're trying to influence in, in these models. Kim? Yeah, that, that was great, Adam. I think, you know, just like CMS has the constraints of um, balancing driving value or driving um, quality and the affordability, we don't want to drive up premiums for people as we implement new pro programs. So that's sort of fundamental. The, the other thing that I would say, are there just some very practical things that sometimes get in our way of implementation? So for instance, um, uh, codes to put in our billing system, our claim system. Sometimes it's hard to develop a new innovative program because we don't have the codes to put into our claim system to be able to pay for like interdisciplinary palliative care. So sometimes it's really small practical things. And then the, the other thing that can be a challenge is when you're paying for quality, how do you how do you measure quality, and then how do you get those those um, reports back into your system? So there's a lot of quality data. Most quality of data we we can't pull out of our claim system. We re rely on the providers to report that to us. Um, you know, and again, like Adam said, there has to be that trust between the provider group in the insurer when you're um, measuring quality that way. And that's where um, things like PCQC come in and I think are gonna be really important as we move forward toward value-based payment models. I, 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 I did, Adam, go ahead, I'm sorry. I, mean, yeah, I was just gonna actually put another exclamation point into what Kim said because the other challenge is the um, non-interoperability of EMRs across the system. 
Yeah. And so to Kim's point, we have some providers who are using small EMRs. We have a few who aren't even using EMRs yet, but they have difficulty in producing even just the simple quality reports, just the, the heatest metrics um, that we want to track with them and for them um, as part of this model, that because of the variability of EMRs and the capability of the different EMRs across the system makes that very complicated. I'm going to thank you for sort of raising the issue of quality. You know, cost has been such a burden to our system for so long. I think in that uh, in the value equation where it is expressed as a quotient of quality over cost, I think sometimes the quality gets lost. So I think featuring that is important. And the interoperability challenges are vexing. They're vexing for clinicians first and foremost. I, I have patients who are seen in various. Uh, systems where I don't have access to there, but also when we're thinking about care design. So solutions like PCQC, which is a registry, which can mine data out of some EHRs, I, I, I think is a step in the right direction. I'd actually like to invite Arif to comment and address a, a theme in the questions in the Q&A about how do we, with all of these kind of diverse models and opportunities, right? This idea that we're not going to have one solution. It's going to be, you know, a portfolio of solutions. And they're going to be models, some of which are applicable to certain practices and payers, and some in the Medicare Advantage space and some in the fee-for-service space. How do we ensure that the quality of serious illness care that an individual and their family caregivers receive is maintained regardless of how their providers get paid for it? Well, I, I think it's time within Palliative Care 3.0, and, and I think that I love the quintuple aim of Blue Shield. I, I think it's time for broad scale uh, patient reported outcome performance measurement. And I think if you really wanna know, you go ask the patients and the caregivers themselves. And to do that, I mean, clearly there are structural things that, that have to change to be able to do that, but we also need quality measures that are particularly focused on taking the patient caregiver voice in real time, not three months after the fact or six months after the fact or during the brief setting and actually create a learning health system that is agile and continuously improves based on real time patient reported data on quality. And I think to be able to do that, we have to think about where the gaps and how we can measure things like right now, that is oftentimes structured as patient experience, patient satisfaction or bereaved family members. But we have to think broadly uh, beyond that. So I think that's one area to start. The other area is clearly um, caregiver and uh, financial toxicity. So those are two domain areas that I talked about that I think we don't have quality measures for and we should be measuring in real time and you know making our care agile and responsive to that. So for example, I'll challenge anybody to list a quality measure that particularly focuses on caregiver needs. Uh, I struggle to do that. But until we have those, we can't really be responsive to the unit of care, which is the, the patient, the family, their loved ones, and their community. And lastly, for out-of-pocket costs, we recognize that out-of-pocket costs are a huge problem for many, most patients, if not all, with complex serious illnesses and injury. And we don't have a real-time way to monitor that, assess it, and be responsive to it. So I, I, I would advocate for us as a community to really think about putting the patient as our North Star and their caregiver and using their voice to guide quality by asking them directly. Thank you, Arif. I think that was compelling. I, you know, just one one small element of that is is the combination of financial toxicity as kind of driven by out of pocket costs. I was impressed that the Blue Shield of California model expressly does not require copays or co insurance for the home based palliative care model. I know that there are again statutory constraints in CMS, uh, that there's been some legislation in the House, um, at, at least and maybe in the Senate, to start looking at trying to reduce or eliminate co-insurance for certain high-value services. Some of those are statutorily um, uh, covered for prevention. Um, we would love to hear uh, kind of Amy and, and or Megan's ideas about can we think with it out of their regulatory or even the legislative framework about how we reduce that financial burden on Medicare beneficiaries and their families. Have you had thoughts about that or discussions internally that you can share? I'll just say briefly, you know, I think that's part of an ongoing conversation for how do we reduce barriers to access to care 
and balance that with um, you if you're looking at the private market, how does that impact cost of premiums as you do different requirements? Um, some of those will increase what is paid overall. Um, when you look at Medicare, I think the work um, of the Invasion Center, and, and I'll turn over to Amy to speak more on this, but that's where we've just seen some great results. And I think there's still a lot of promise to be had from um, using that model where you have the flexibility to test even adding benefits um, in a way that you think is going to improve quality to the point where you can get to a cost neutral, like what we saw with diabetes prevention, um, adding some of that in. So um, I'll turn over to her. Yeah, no, thanks. I think we, we have thought about that a lot. We were very sensitive to the costs um, that you know, continue to pi could pile up for patients who have you know, seen multiple specialists, lots of different treatments. There's, uh, I can't remember, I know there's a couple of services that we have actually waived the co-insurance for in some of our models um, where we've added additional services. I don't remember specifically, I'd have to get back on the specific ones there, but we don't want it to be, ex you know, we don't want to add an additional burden for patients who are in our models if we're adding additional services. But it is a, a major, um, you know, something we think about a lot of what does it mean, especially you know, we look into either expensive drugs or other treatments and, you know, things that we're thinking about, you know, making sure that patients can get counseling in our oncology models and they can be, you know, making these choices and go into their treatments aware of what the potential costs are, you know, at, encouraging them to ask their doctors about other alternative, you know, what, you know, how are you making decisions on what to use? So it's something that we don't necessarily have an answer for, but we're very much aware of and want to add to part of the, you know, patient education and sort of decision making. Excellent. And and yeah. Phil, if I could add, um, so there's not a lot of data yet on the financial toxicity of palliative care delivery itself, which we're kind of talking about here, but I can share that, um, you know, we're working on a project with Jennifer Temel and her group there. It's a randomized control trial, and it's patients with lung cancer getting palliative care monthly or as needed. And the, the point, though, is, is when we go to enroll these patients in this clinical trial, about 20% of them, one in five, say, I will not enroll in your trial because I'm deathly afraid that I will be randomized to the monthly arm. And what they're saying is that I can't pay the forty to eighty dollar commercial insurance copay. So sounds great. You sound like lovely people. I think you can help me, but please don't make me come every month. Not because I don't think you can help me, but because I can't afford that copay. So I think it's important to recognize that even the delivery of these great services we're talking about can introduce financial toxicity. And exploring all the different ways to ameliorate that is really important. Really mindful, and you know that that's actually a great um, uh, sort of opening to pull on a few threads from the Q and A, which is really valuable. That kind of reflects back on the uh, Blue Shield model. And you know, if I can summarize some some of the questions, there's interest in understanding: uh, Are there lessons learned, or are there uh, kind of designed uh, elements in your population that could potentially influence? the way this gets uh, delivered elsewhere. Specifically, um, what's the percentage, for example, of fee-for-service versus capitated uh, uh, patients in, in your programs now? Does the population you're working with look enough like the population, for example, that, that the innovation center is looking at, that there can be some, some kind of cross-pollination of ideas? And, can it early success help inform federal model delivery? And one specific question, if I can add an appendix, this goes way down in the weeds, but is a is a is a discussion point that Amy's team and we have had over the time we've worked together is that we be I believe I heard and others did that Blue Shield has engaged a vendor that that has allowed them to sort of reach out and help bring patients either into the model or at least make them up with aware of it. Can you share the, the experience? That's just kind of one example of these lessons that might might be transferable. I can go backwards with some of those questions. Sure. So the vendor, um, so we no longer contract with the vendor for our outreach and engagement because we haven't found it to be very, you have to make a lot of cold, basically cold calls um, in order to find members who are interested in engaging. We're also with our claims data. In claims data, you don't have functional um, status, you don't have social determinants, it's really hard to pull out the patients who will really benefit from palliative care. So I feel pretty strongly at this point that 
we need to partner with our primary care providers and our subspecialists and our hospitalists to, in the clinical setting, identify those patients and get them um, referred. In terms of um, the mix of patients, so there were MA patients in our population, there are commercial patients. Um, in California, we, because of it, it's actually a benefit to provide it for um, Medicaid patients. So there, so we do have a pretty good um, mix of members. You do see probably higher cost saving in your commercial members because we pay, because the, the fact the savings is for ED visits and hospitalizations, and we pay more for those um, in the commercial setting than we pay um, for most of the MA plans. Um, Adam, what do you have to add to that? The only thing I would add is how we're trying to use data points from multiple data sources, both internal and external data sources, including incorporating data about those social determinants of health to help to test outreach. Mm -hmm. We're testing some new models using the community health advocates, for example, to do outreach in advance of some of these needs or to identify some of these needs before they become more severe or serious um, and incorporating that in, in our workflow and those to support our providers as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. And this is a fantastic discussion that I wish could go on all afternoon, but we are kind of coming up to sort of our last uh, uh, question. I, and, and I want to kind of um, echo uh, a reef's appreciation of the expansion of Blue Shield's aim to, to include the fifth aim of equity. And that's been a, a, a feature of our planning from the beginning. So I'd like to invite each of you briefly to, to talk about what you think are the real priorities to in, in the work that you're doing to ensure that access to high quality serious illness care is available to all, especially those from vulnerable and, and, and modern minoritized communities. So I'd invite anyone to start. Well, I think, you know, we know that in terms of access to palliative care and who, who really takes advantage of palliative care, it's very skewed toward the white population and our minority and vulnerable um, populations tend to not have, they, they don't trust the healthcare, there's a lack of trust in the healthcare system. And I think that's one of the reasons that they um, don't access the services. So I think we have a long way to go to try and build trust. And at a very basic level, I think one of the things that we're doing, and we do this for our palliative care program, again, is using the community health advocates that are, who are from the community and who have some trust to talk to people about services across the board, but including um, palliative care services. Can I, let me just add on to that briefly and then Amy, I'll, I'll pass it off to you if that's okay, because it relates to what Kim just said, is I think we also need to support our BIPOC provider community because it's through those providers where we can hopefully begin to see a slow chipping away at that distrust towards trust of the provider community in the healthcare system. Amy. Thanks, I, I agree with all of that. You know, we're doing, having similar efforts also I think as we think further about those and put it more front and center and be more aware of who is in our models, both from the provider participant and then the, the patient side and doing more active recruitment to bring uh, organizations in either underserved communities or other you know, ways into our model. And so that sort of gets to some of the things I said earlier about, you know, does it mean we have to like look a slightly differently at our model design to make sure we are getting to those different populations? Is it working with different types of providers? Is it, you know, how, how is it working with the community as we think about, um, you know, different ways to address it? Because, you know, putting equity front and center uh, is, you know, there's just a number of different ways we're going to take it, both sort of in our model design, in our partnerships, working with the communities, also getting a feedback from, you know, what do people want from the models? You know, we've sort of focused on a number of areas in our portfolio, and um, there, it may not be sort of where we need to be, but as we sort of broaden or continue the movement to value, 
<clears throat> you know, really engaging with the stakeholders of all types, especially voices that are not been traditionally heard at, around our table, so to speak, uh, to see how what they need and what would be most helpful for for them as well. And okay. Phil, yeah, if I if I can just add, you know, I, I think there's there's high level things, and I'm just very proud to say for for Pride Month and and for the work we're doing with PCQC that we're trying to be very precise and accurate about how we collect demographic data on the patients that we serve within the quality registry. So for example, we've got a big initiative now around sexual orientation and gender identity, which is really important for us to get right to collect that data, because what that does is it starts to very accurately inform what are the serious illness and palliative care needs of all particular populations and how do we match those services in the right way. But that starts by actually collecting that data and doing it in a very deliberate way from the beginning. Excellent. Great, I can jump in. So in addition to um, the specialists coming into communities where there's a lag, I think looking just at bringing healthcare where people are. And mobile clinics is another one that um, Senator Rosen has been working on, not only as we've looked at the context from um, COVID vaccinations, but just in general. We have communities in Nevada that don't even have a pharmacy, let alone a primary care office. So she has other legislation that would um, address the some flexibility within existing funding streams so our community health centers could be as creative as possible to reaching out and bringing care to folks who may have trouble accessing. I think that goes a long way into the equity question. And then the other piece of it is uh, we need people to provide the care. And the more we can do to encourage um, in all of our communities to really pull in from those communities, um, get students interested in the health sciences, um, really promote, and the healthcare has such an amazing upward trajectory where you can get your you know, license to be a medical assistant while you're still finishing high school. What a great way to, um, you know, have a career track. Same with uh, with nursing, um, and just getting students with the idea that this is for you. This is for all of our communities to be involved. Um, but I think that helps as the communities reflect those that they serve. Uh, we're going to make some progress on that. Excellent. And I would I would invite Mike to close us out. Oh, thank you. Um, the one and it's a really quick point, but the one thing I wanted to add. And I think would be really apropos in this case, though, is I can tell you that I know from the MS community, especially, um, you know, there's a lot of intimidation, honestly, though, when they're going to both the primary care as well as the specialist, though, peer coordination in terms of talking to basically people who have been through the same life experience, though, with the MS and stuff like that. And, and again, I don't know from a policy perspective, because I know HIP and everything else. But at the same time, though, I think basically getting someone who can actually help, you know, a fellow patient talk through it, though, I think that'd be apropos and very you know, utilitarian for everything. So thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank you to all of the presenters and panelists. This was an incredibly rich discussion. Uh, I had a whole lot of fun. It was the high level night of my month um, and maybe my year. So I, I th th thank you for all your attempt today. We'll look forward to ongoing collaboration. I think we all share the same goal to, to, to raise the bar for serious illness care everywhere. Um, and with that, I will hand things back to Dr. Davidson. Dr. Davidson. So many of you may know that Dr. Davidson uh, was extraordinarily generous with her time as she transitioned to a role from Johns Hopkins to one at Wollongong University in Australia. So it's actually the middle of the night where she is. So I'm going to take the co-chair prerogative of introducing Dr. Lars Peterson, who will be our moderator for session four. Lars? All right, thanks, Phil. That was a really engaging um, session three. So um, briefly, I'm Lars Peterson. I'm the vice president of research at the American Board of Family Medicine and was a member of the planning session for this uh, workshop. It's been fantastic to see um, it actually occur. And we had some great speakers so far, and hopefully we'll end on a real high note here and talk about how this all comes together in promising integrated models of care delivery. 
Um, so first, we're going to hear from Deborah, Dr. Deborah Swider Swiderski, um, who is an associate professor of um, medicine and family and social medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and also the Montfiore Medical Center. Dr. Swiderski will discuss serious illness conversations in federally qualified health centers. Um, then we're going to hear from Dr. Fassel Said, Said uh, who is the National Director of Primary Care at ChenMed, about their efforts on treating patients with serious illness. And then uh, we'll transition to Dr. Thomas Eads, who is a senior medical advisor in geriatrics and extended care at the, at the Veterans Affairs uh, Department about the VA's efforts on addressing serious illness care in the emergency care setting. And then finally, we'll hear, we'll hear from Dr. Neela Patel, who is an associate professor and chief of the Division of Geriatrics and Palliative Care in the Departments of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Texas, San Antonio, on their work bringing serious illness care into the patient's home. Um, and as a reminder, uh, the full speaker bios can be found in the briefing book on the um, event webpage if you'd like to read more. And then as Phil mentioned in the last session, uh, we've asked the speakers to limit their talks to 10 minutes, which I'm sure is challenging given the great work they've done. And I'm sure they could each fill at least a half hour on what they're doing. So following uh, Dr. Patel, who's our last speaker, we'll have a discussion among the speakers and then take audience questions like we've just done with the last session. So please enter your questions into the Q&A on the Zoom function and we'll be monitoring those throughout. So with that, we will be transitioning over to Dr. Swiderski. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm a primary care internist. Uh, I've spent my career as a clinician educator, seeing patients and training primary care residents in the South Bronx, which is where the work I'm gonna to talk to you about was, was uh, done. Uh, I'm gonna to speak to you today about our effort to integrate serious illness care into two federally qualified health centers. Next slide, please. In 2018, we received funding from Ariadne Labs, Harvard University for salary support to implement serious illness conversation training in two Bronx FQHCs using Ariadne's serious illness conversation guide, which is a checklist approach to embedding this work in clinical practice. Much of the work looking at the effectiveness of this checklist had been done in well-resourced sites serving primarily white, well-insured patients. We were very interested to see if and how it would work in our environment. Specifically, our patients and communities are affected by high rates of poverty um, and they're underinsured or uninsured, many of them, um, with reference to the last panel. They, face, um, they are the face of health disparities, which we know leads to very complex presentations of chronic illness. And RFQHCs are overburdened, under-resourced, and highly stressed work sites. We trained 15 family medicine physicians, uh, attending physicians, and four uh, nurses at two of the FQHCs. 11 of the 15 physicians who we trained had 37 conversations using the guide over a six-month period. We then interviewed those 11 physicians about their experience using the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and conducted a qualitative analysis of those interviews. What I'm gonna review with you now are some of the lessons that we learned about our implementation efforts and the barriers that were articulated in our analysis of physician experience. Next slide. So I'm sure you all know this and this, uh, It Takes a Village was quoted I think three or four times in the, the previous session. Um, but the first step towards success in any endeavor is to assemble the right group. In our case, we had about nine months to get our work done and we needed to be nimble. So we couldn't be too big, but not too small either. Several members of our team are committed primary care providers in Montefiore's FQHCs. And that ensured that we began with a deep experiential knowledge of the environment that we were trying to influence in contrast, say, to if it was a palliative care specialist going in, not being part of that working uh, setting. And it's important to mention that as the clinical lead, I also brought substantial experience to the content area. I've been teaching it for over 30, 20 years to my residents. So I hit the ground running with that. It was a great strength of our group that individuals brought <clears throat> complementary skill sets, which I've, I've noted there. 
Um, and we made sure to schedule re regular meetings uh, to check in on problems and progress. And it's important also to note that everyone involved in this effort shared a strong sense of mission, which we've heard a lot about in these presentations. Our goal was to improve the quality of care for the patients and the communities that we serve in serious illness uh, domain. Next slide. So a few notes on our process. Uh, to promote buy-in as the clinical lead, I made it a point of personally engaging with all stakeholders. I usually did that in person. This was pre-COVID. I met with executive directors, medical directors, nursing leadership and site personnel, social workers, and primary care providers. I made short presentations at site team meetings. I wrangled the family medicine grand rounds. Uh, and I used these not just to present what the project was, but as opportunities for informal needs assessment, which is crucial. Most importantly, I made sure, we made sure to schedule training sessions at already scheduled meeting times so that there was no extra time commitment requ required from, for training from our already overburdened PCPs. Next slide. Coaching and support after formal training are essential to cement this effort. The initial phase of our project, which had very lean funding, suffered from a lack of this, but we're fortunate now to have a project manager who helps to organize and implement this aspect of the work. Coaching and support should target many levels. So individual PCPs to help them identify appropriate patients and carry out the work, uh, group coaching, programmatic level reminders and refreshers, such as a newsletter, which we now have, and I think it's a, a terrific thing, grand rounds, ongoing grand rounds presentations and things like that. And obviously we need to be organized about who is doing what and when it should happen. Next slide. I cannot overstate the importance <clears throat> of a site champion, meaning a person at each of our places where we were implementing this to be the on-person, on-site person. We have been very lucky to have those individuals emerge without any effort on our part. Um, they play a crucial function in figuring out site-specific workflows. Um, we realized early on that a cookie cutter approach to this would, would not work. It has to be emerged from the site itself. Uh, they help to maintain momentum for the project and can play a big role in coaching and support. In our project thus far, these individuals are not compensated with either funding or time. So we've made it a point to make sure that their dedication to the work is rewarded at least with some extra training and support to help them build their knowledge base and their CV. Next slide. And lastly, under implementation, it's important to mention documentation and billing. Montefiore uses the EPIC EHR uh, we developed a so-called dot phrase, which allows PCPs to automatically populate their note with the checklist template, which ensured uniform documentation and also made it easier for the docs to, to use it. Um, we've also worked hard to promote documentation in a standardized, standardized location in the visit note. This allows for tracking of visits to assess progress, provides feedback at the provider level and promotes accurate billing. And in addition, if it researches on your agenda, which it is on ours, it helps to create a database. Working to assure accurate billing for these visits is also essential, although at least in our institution, it has not proved easy. The use of the guide allows for the use of the advanced care planning CPT codes, which then of course leads to enhanced RVUs. And if we are aiming for long-term institutional change, we need to demonstrate potential cost savings, which has already been mentioned. Next slide. And now to the provider experience of using the Serious Illness Conversation Guide in, in our FQHC environment. Uh, these slides are labeled as barriers, but in truth, there was a substantial amount of positive news as well. And I'll talk about both of those. Um, I, for one, was concerned at the start of the project that no one would want to use a checklist for this work. I was dubious about it myself. And in fact, it does represent a significant culture change for most PCPs. We found, though, that despite initial resistance, the majority of physicians felt that the serious illness conversation template was very useful in having these difficult conversations. 
we know from the literature that discussing prognosis is difficult terrain for physicians, and this was true in our sample. However, all 11 physicians were clear that it was very much worth the effort. The guide helped them to do it, and it was very worthwhile. They reported a deepening of the relationship with their patients and enhanced clinical awareness. Next slide. It is not surprising that poverty and underinsurance make it difficult to include the serious illness conversation in a patient visit in our settings. Pressing concrete social and financial needs complicate many visits and must be attended to. The patient's social context affects the ability to integrate this work as well. There are many examples of this, but the two common ones are the legacy and experience of racism in all of its forms, which is a big contributor to mistrust in the medical system. And COVID, of course, shined a very bright light on health disparities in our community. And complex family dynamics may make it difficult for patients to focus on goals of care, which should include loved ones and support networks. Uh, communication barriers loom large in our health centers. Our network cares for people from at least 30 different countries, and I don't know how many languages and dialects. Add to that in a post-COVID world, the difficulty of attempting to have these nuanced conversations on the telephone with an interpreter in between. Uh, and lastly, the burden of trying to communicate with patients with an array of physical and mental disabilities that are often undertreated for a variety of reasons, the biggest one being access to care. Next slide. Our doctors uniformly reported that the emotional work of having these conversations was humanizing and restored meaning to their work but every one of them reported that it took an emotional toll and many struggled with that. Last but not least is the problem of time of which there's never enough in primary care. And that was probably amplified in our under-resourced settings. But because they found the work important and meaningful, doctors forged ahead. But this remains a significant um, obstacle to be reckoned with. Next slide. And last slide. So in summary, implementing the serious illness conversation in under-resourced settings presents specific challenges. A small amount of seed funding in the right circumstances can accomplish a lot as it did with us. Specifically for our project, having a, our core team already deeply embedded in and prepared to adapt to the environment made the work much easier. We found that trying to get PCPs to use a checklist was a matter of culture change but ultimately was felt to be helpful. And the numerous barriers in doing this work in these settings was truly tempered by the affirmation of the importance of relationship-based care. This work has meaning, but these barriers are real and will require systems change for large scale implementation to occur. Um, the quote you see there is from one of our site champions who also happens to be the medical director for one of the original sites. And I think it kind of says it all. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for that great talk about how it's going. I'm, I have some follow-up questions for you already, but we'll get to those in the panel. So it's great to hear about the work you're doing. Um, next, we'll transition to Dr. Um, Fasil Saeed from uh, ChenMed. And he is, as I complimented him in our warm-up, uh, going without slides. I'm kind of fascinated. I haven't seen one of these in a while, so I, I like the old school approach. So with that, I'll just turn it over and tell us about what you're doing. Sure. Hello. It's an honor to be here with you all. Today's topic is personal for me because it's about my dad. My dad was an inventor. He holds over 20 technical patents for things like caller ID, voice recognition, and flash memory. But then dad got sick, heart disease, diabetes, chronic low back pain, and memory loss. He saw five specialists, but not a PCP. He often bragged about paying extra so he wouldn't need a PCP. But in the end, his care was uncoordinated and ineffective. None of his five specialists spoke with each other. Dad was taking pills for side effects from other pills. It was terrible. Eventually, I convinced him to sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan where PCP would coordinate his care. 
He was skeptical, but he humored me. Today, dad's heart function is normal. His diabetes is under control. His back pain and memory loss are gone, and he's on very few meds. So when we talk about delivering high quality, integrated primary care for serious illnesses, I think about dad and others like him. People in this country who are older typically and medically complex. 15% of the country is over the age of 65. Their medical costs are now over $1 trillion and they aren't even getting healthy. That's because doctors in fee-for-service care, which makes up 95% of the care in America today, suffer from transaction distraction. They spend the bulk of their time worrying about RVUs rather than proactively coaching their elderly patients to better health. Less than 1% of care delivery in America is the fully capitated value-based care model. Value-based care is about improving quality of care. It's about improving patient satisfaction, provider satisfaction, and saving money. Do these things and you're achieving the quadruple aim. Achieving the quadruple aim starts when we acknowledge that the doctor-patient relationship is sacred. The doctor-to-doctor -doctor relationship is congenial and collaborative. The doctor-to-staff relationship is courteous and codependent. You can't have integrated care without integrated relationships. At ChenMed, we give our patients and their families our cell phone numbers. They call us if they're feeling, as my wife likes to say, a little licky. And if we need help getting our patients to stick to a treatment plan, we call their kids and grandkids for backup. Our patients get a daily text about health, simple messages, like reminding them to get a flu shot or stay hydrated on a hot summer day. We call them weekly, even if they're healthy and feeling good, we make them feel better just by saying hello. And we see them at least monthly. This is how we prevent little problems from becoming big ones. Look, anyone can learn the pathophysiology it takes to keep people healthy, but the knowledge is useless if your patients don't trust you. When there is trust between the doctor and the patient, they can then create achievable goals that lead to better health. Trust also leads to something else. One of the hardest discussions that no one wants to have is about end of life wishes. But when trust exists between the doctor and the patient, these discussions often happen naturally. The patient appreciates it, the family appreciates it, and the physician remembers why he or she became a doctor in the first place, to ease suffering. This model works, and if it works with our patients, it will work with any patient. ChenMed patients are some of the most underserved people in America. They're elderly, they're medically complex, they're on fixed incomes. These people fought in wars, marched for civil rights, and built our cities and suburbs. Then they fell through society's cracks. Studies estimate that medical care accounts for 10 to 20% of the modifiable contributors to improved health outcomes. 70% of medical outcomes are based on patient lifestyle. We can't just look at the patient. We also have to look at where the patient comes from. We must examine the causes of the causes. Access to great medical care is worthless if you don't have the transportation to get it. I tell our people, I tell people that our care model is a throwback to a completely different era. We're like Marcus Welby with technology. We started as a single medical practice in Miami 36 years ago. One center became two, then three, then four and five. Then Humana came to us and asked us if our model would work in other cities. We knew it would. And you know, it's funny. Every time I go to a new city, I hear the same thing. Oh, you have no idea. We're a big, small town. What you did in Miami and in Florida, that won't work here. Our problems are unique. I always listen, smile, and nod my head. And then I say, you know, we've been expanding for years. Even during the height of the pandemic, when practices were going out of business, 
and healthcare workers across the country were being furloughed, we kept growing in cities just like yours. And I think to myself, yeah, and we're not dependent on venture capital either. We keep growing because the model keeps us profitable. In our high touch integrated value-based care model, we're saving 30 to 50% by keeping people healthy and out of the hospital. Sounds simple, right? It should be. But pre-COVID-19, half of all medical care in the country was delivered in hospital emergency rooms. More than $1 trillion a year was wasted on unnecessary hospitalizations. That's the fee-for-service model. In high-touch, integrated, value-based care, doctors focus on improving health rather than generating RVUs. There are things that we can do that should be standard protocol. If we know medications are critical to improved health, then why do we let the patient walk out the door without their medications? If we know heart disease is the number one killer, then why not have cardiologists work hand in hand with PCPs? If we know a large part of improving health is, in, is overcoming barriers to care, then why not have social workers integrated into the care team? We claim to have the world's best healthcare system. And if you have a complex disease and money, the care you get is remarkable. But we can't improve healthcare for everyone if the access to healthcare or patient lifestyles are substandard or beyond someone's means. As a society, we must invest in services that address the basics, economic instability, food and housing insecurity, transportation, education, and health literacy. We also claim to have the best medical education in the world. But when doctors graduate with a quarter million dollars of debt, they're financially penalized for going into primary care. Primary care doctors are supposed to be at the center of the healthcare delivery model, supposed to be the gateway to better health, not the gatekeeper to medication refills and referrals. But debt has diminished the role of primary care. Everyone wants higher paying jobs as specialists. We are suffering from a shortage of primary care doctors and that won't change until we level the compensation playing field. Finally, we must take a hard look at a bigger financial problem. I saw a movie once. And there was a line that really stuck with me. When you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the solution. The improbable solution for transitioning to a high quality integrated primary care model is paying for health instead of transactions. Look, anytime you mess with people's money, you're gonna get pushback but we must start paying for better health rather than transactions. Doctors and insurance companies must work together, switch the goal from billing to well-being. reward doctors for making people healthier. Transactions do not lead to better health. They only lead to more transactions. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Said. That was very powerful and great. Um, glad to hear your dad's doing better. So fascinated to hear more in the, in the Q&A about the ChenMed model and how it works specifically with serious illness care. But um, for now, uh, we'll transition over to uh, Dr. Eads. He's going to tell us about different care setting and how serious illness care is working in the VA in emergency settings. All right, Dr. Eads, thank you. Yes, hello. I'm, I'm a geriatrician. I'm honored to be a participant in this workshop and with the opportunity to, to discuss um, with you our Department of Veterans Affairs transformation of urgent and emergent care for veterans with serious chronic disabling conditions. Next slide, please. Now, for years, I've encouraged those I'm privileged to work with to create serendipity. I know that's an oxymoron. And that likely explains some of my challenges in disorderly thinking. But for my 37 years of working in healthcare, I identify three key elements of successful change. 
And they're really reflected in this conversation today. One is the power of persistence, the importance of serendipity, and that no meaningful changes in healthcare occur without collaboration. Our VA transformation was sparked by a convergence of problems and a convergence of solutions. Look at these problems. We've talked about them today, every one of them. The worsening health, the worsening healthcare workforce shortage, the increased population of those with serious chronic diseases, the unmet needs, many, so, many are social determinants of health, the unsustainable rise in healthcare costs fragmented care. And then, but look at these conversions of solutions, the rise in the recognized value of interdisciplinary teams, of person-centered care, the expansion of the movement of age-friendly health systems. VA is emerging with a, a new workforce of intermediate care technicians. And these are former military medics and corpsmen that come to us with some really incredible skills. It was really through this coordination and collaboration among emergency medicine, geriatrics and primary care that led to our VA transformation to implement geriatric emergency departments. Next slide. Um, I'd like to start with a, an illustrative case from our one of our geriatric emergency departments. This was an 87 year old with heart disease, hypertension, a number of other conditions. He was discharged to home after a hospitalization for a change in cognition, may have had a stroke, now he had multiple family members and they worked hard to try to help him stay at home, but they all worked and none of them were able to remain with him um, full 24 seven. So 17 days later, he was back in the emergency department for falls. The emergency department crew did what they do very well. They quickly ascertained this person has, uh, is medically stable. And in some instances may have been discharged to home at that point. But uh, he was identified as a senior at risk because this is a geriatric emergency department. That led to involvement of an interdisciplinary team, a social worker, physical therapist, pharmacist. They identified some significant unmet needs that would likely complicate this person's ability to remain at home if discharged to home. So they altered the care plan. And what resulted was a short stay in acute, a short stay rehab care during that time, because of what these folks put in place, there, was, there were things put in place to do a home safety evaluation, to start some caregiver support respite, to, to get uh, durable medical equipment out there, to have the home supportive services. And as a result of that, there was a successful discharge to the home. Next slide. Now, a few timely and unpredictable events led to our um, VA transformation. After Hurricane Katrina, one of our senior national senior executive leaders in VA chose to step down from that position, go to New Orleans, and re help rebuild the healthcare systems in New Orleans. Virtually all of them had been wiped out. He gave me a call one day and said, Tom, I want New Orleans to be the exemplary model for older veterans. I said to Mr. Rivera, you know, I am absolutely eager to help you with that. So I arranged to make a, one of my first, my first visit down there. I arranged to meet with several of the folks, the leaders from the variety of geriatric palliative care programs, but I also wanted to meet with all others. And one of them was the director of the emergency department. I sat down with Julie Slick and I said, Julie, is there anything that we can do in geriatrics that would help you improve the care of older veterans with serious chronic diseases who show up in your emergency department? She said, here's what happens. They come to our emergency department. We quickly ascertain they do not have medical or surgical emergencies. We're good at that. We also quickly ascertain they cannot safely go home. So then what happens? We spend a little more time, which is precious in the emergency department, to find a reason to put this person in the hospital. They're usually not, there usually is one. We admit them to the hospital, but we know that's probably not best. We know that these older, complicated veterans. When we put them in the hospital, they're higher risk for delirium, higher risk for falls and injuries, higher risk for infections, higher risk for functional decline. They come out, they end up getting worse rather than better. Is there anything you can do? I said, Julie, that's exactly what I needed to hear. So I got back to Washington. I called Chad Kessler, the National Director of Emergency Medicine. We've been collaborating ever since. Other things happened. Um, the emergence of age-friendly health care systems. And in 2019, the Office of VA Geriatrics and Extended Care 
made implementing age-friendly health systems, system-wide MBA, a strategic priority. February 2020, February 4th, 2020, we launched our initiative, our first cohort of 20 VA emergency departments. These sites had volunteered. They were excited as we were. They want to change their practices. They want to go for geriatric emergency department accreditation. Well, what happened after that? Next slide. So where we are was totally dependent on the critical collaboration with external partners, John A. Hartford Foundation, West Health Institute, the American College of Emergency Physicians, the brilliant pioneers of a geriatric emergency department collaboration, a collaborative who gave us their insights, and then internal partners, including the VA geriatric research, education, and clinical centers. Next slide. What are the standards for geriatric emergency department accreditation? Uh, ASAP created these, this, this entry level, level three, that virtually any emergency department could, could achieve. Yes, you need to have a physician and nurse champion to get things started. You put a minimum of resources, modest resources, to have, make sure you have mobility aids and food and drink available 24-7. Level two adds... Um, a little bit of a, a number of elements, actually quite a bit stronger, right? You've got to have a nurse case manager there 56 hours a week. You have to have an interdisciplinary team. You have to have hospital support. You have to have education and training. And you have to start working on policies and protocols and outcomes. Then level one, the highest level, adds a patient advisor. You expand your interdisciplinary team, expand your protocols, your outcomes, more enhancements. Next slide. On February 4th, 2020, I presented to the, that cohort the concept of age-friendly health system. For this reason, I said to them, you know, this is focused around the four Ms, what matters, medication, mentation, and mobility. And this fits exactly within the practice changes you are gearing up to make. And if you implement these four Ms in your practices, it will improve um, the effectiveness of the care you deliver to these individuals in the emergency department and what matters needs to drive that. Next slide. Well, what happened after February, right? Within a month, the world had changed. COVID had just swept the country. Um, and so we called back together those teams on a conference call about a month later and said, the world has changed. We understand completely if you are not comfortable going forward with this, you wanna postpone it, you want us to work with you later, whenever you are comfortable, whenever you feel like is the right time. We're ready to do that. However, we'd like to just spend a few minutes to go over what were the reasons you chose to start this initiative? Well, one of them high, high prevalence in VA, half of the veterans who come into our VA emergency departments are over the age of 65. They knew that many of them had unmet needs, they, they really wanted to increase the proportion of these individuals who would be safely discharged to home rather than a hospital. They wanted to reduce the 30-day returns to the, to the emergency department. Next slide. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the goals of care were uh, identified and, uh, and that aligned with the care plan. They wanted to reduce fragmentation. They wanted to increase coordination with primary care and the continuity. They wanted to interrupt that trajectory for high-risk persons to come into the emergency department in the hospital, decline in the hospital, maybe go into um, long-stay nursing home care. What could they do? And, and this uh, to be part of this shift of care, not just from the hospital to the home and the, and the nursing home to home, but from the emergency department to home, reduce total cost of care. Next slide. So what happened? May 21, we're barely over a year since then, and through the worst pandemic in 100 years, and 12 of these sites now have achieved uh, American College of Emergency Physician accreditation as geriatric emergency departments. Another eight have their applications in review, and on May 6th, we were overwhelmed with a number of additional sites that wanted to begin this journey. We took more than we expected we could handle, but we think we can handle this 32 additional VA emergency departments, and one VA urgent care center. 
that will get to us to just about half of our 110 VA emergency departments around the country. Next slide. So I wanna kind of wrap up with this illustrative slide, another example in our geriatric emergency department. This 85 year old presented to the emergency department with balls. Triage did what they do well, identified there were no fractures, no serious injury, this person was medically stable. However, he was identified as a senior at risk. So he was referred to a social worker and an intermediate care technician, the former military medic. The social worker evaluated, felt like this person may not be fully disclosing some of their concerns. The social worker just felt like something wasn't quite, quite right. So the intermediate care technician stepped in. And as a former military medic, had an immediate bond of trust with that veteran. And that veteran opened up. He admitted he was struggling to take care of himself at home. He said he was depressed. Disclosed that he, his wife had recent his wife of 60 years had recently been placed in a nursing facility. Yes, he was feeling depressed, but also another element came up that likely would not have come up in the normal context of an emergency department. And that was, he felt like his family was subjecting him to um, um, you know, financial abuse. They were, they were really taking exploitation. So as a result of all of that, we got to this, they got to the bottom line of what really mattered most to this veteran. And it was not to return home. He wanted to get back to reuniting with his wife of 60 years. So they made that happen. They started the processes for him to then be moved into the nursing home where his wife lived. And I bring this up because it's not fitting with like part of the organizational construct of this initiative to reduce, to shift care to the home, reduce total costs. But what is more important and ultimately always important of all these things we've talked about today is this must be driven on the individual basis by what matters most. Next slide. So what can we do to really tar start, um, start taking? What, we, what actions can we take? Well, take a look at your emergency department. What percentage are over the age, age of 65? What percent get hospitalized? What percent return to emergency department within 30 days? Or identify seniors at risk in your emergency department and refer them to primary care social work or those on with potentially inappropriate medications and refer them to primary care. Pull together some champions, somebody from primary care and geriatrics, emergency medicine, maybe somebody from palliative care, social work, others. Get the, get the group thinking and working on this. Start small, connect up your primary care social worker or nurse coordinator with a local emergency department that you work with, or maybe is, is part of your academic center. Start with just one shift a week or a daily check-in. See what happens. Pursue level three, American College of Emergency Physician accreditation um, for a geriatric emergency department. Explore age-friendly health systems and what, what could you do? Where would you like to start in your facility? Work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Integrate what matters into your practice. There's training out there. There are different options and um, so, Think about how to, how to make that step, help your providers integrate what matters, get comfortable with those conversations, be a part of the routine. What's next in VA? We are working on developing the mobile workforce coordinated with the emergency department and the community collaborative partners to avoid the trip to the emergency department whenever that can be done. I think that was, yeah. I just, I just, um, I guess, I just want to say we are very excited with where we are in VA and where we're going in VA, and we're eager to continue learning from and working with others on this journey. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Doctor. I just appreciate your um, presentation and your work at the VA, and definitely have some questions and follow up for you, um, and we'll get to those after our final presentation and our final speaker from Dr. Patel. Um, Dr. Patel, please tell us about the Karinos approach. 
Thank you. I'm also a geriatrician and a palliative care physician, and that makes integrating both of these aspects into primary care a lot easier. The Carinos approach is an approach of care that we uh, have developed over the years, uh, starting in 2010. Next slide, please. So basically, we are a, a division of geriatrics and supportive care with UT Health and academic practice. We serve about a population of 3,000 in various clinical settings, home, nursing homes, assisted living, independent living. Uh, we also have a consult service in the hospital for both geriatrics and palliative care. Um, our, popul our population is about 64% Hispanic and a quarter of it is in underserved communities. Um, this approach of care uh, led us to develop like a home-based um, supportive care program that we call as the Carinos and Sukasa program in the COVID era. So that's one of our outcomes, like with patients being isolated at home and family members not visiting, not being able or allowed to visit uh, assisted living, independent living communities, or uh, wanting to keep their loved ones safe at home. Uh, they were isolated and had uh, limited resources to technology for uh, telehealth visits. So that's what prompted us to increase our number of home uh, visits, not just for primary care, but also for supportive care. Um, Right now, currently, our practice is 50% ambulatory visits and 50% home visits. Next slide, please. So this is our approach. We started at the heart, the center, as the patient and family, and mainly in the ambulatory setting in our outpatient clinic. But we were working as different pockets and not integrated, you know, these arrows may look very simple, but they are actually a complicated network, trying to develop simple, honest, transparent relationships with everybody who's taking care of older persons. I say getting old is not a disease, getting old is life. And a part of getting older is also living with serious illnesses the older we get, because many of the serious illnesses are based on lifestyle choices we make. Uh, so we started with the ambulatory setting, but integrated what we do in the clinic with our hospital service. So we are consultants in the hospital for geriatric care and palliative care. We develop relationships with a hospitalist group in the hospital. We uh, advised our patients for peripheral admission. In fact, our clinic is located close to the hospital and there's a walkway bridge if we needed to admit patients to the hospital directly bypassing the emergency room, we could take them uh, through there. And in situations where they needed to go to the emergency room, we could take them there. So we developed relationships with a hospitalist group so that there was communication when our patients were admitted to the hospital that they could communicate with us and let us know what's the plan of care, what they did, what we need to follow up on, uh, whether there were any medication changes. Uh, we also then collaborated with different rehab centers, skilled rehab and acute rehab if patients from hospital needed those services. We developed a relationship so that there was continuity of care. We were talking to one another. We gave our uh, cell for numbers to one another for easier access. We had access to the medical records from the various places so that we could review the records for the patient. Um, and we also collaborated then with home health agencies and hospice agencies because we used to have a stack of papers to sign from home health and we didn't know really what the home health was doing and if they were making any changes or they were sending patients out to the emergency room instead of communicating with us to see that the patient needed help. So we established relationships with certain home health and hospice agencies. We are also medical directors for them. We do a lot of in-service 
training based on what they want us to train us on and also in service training on this approach of care so that everybody takes responsibility and we put a lot on the primary care physician to coordinate but i think this approach of care gives identifies roles and responsibilities for every person who is caring for the patient and family uh, it's a village, it's a community. So everybody in the community has a role to play and has a certain amount of responsibility. Each one's responsibility is different. Like, uh, healthcare mainly focuses on physical health, but as we get older, especially, mental health, emotional health, social health, spiritual health play a much more important role in physical health outcomes. So we identified resources, especially for persons with dementia uh, and cancer or other serious illnesses, like the Alzheimer's Association, the Area Agencies for Aging, the numerous senior centers that we have here in San Antonio, and a lot of uh, like social work agencies. So we did not have a social worker in clinic before when the model started. So we collaborated with a social work agency that worked pro bono for our patients uh, virtually. And now we do have an embedded social worker in our practice. So we also worked with DME companies and uh, transport agencies when older adults stop driving. Uh, the DME companies, you know, patients would need oxygen or walkers and wheelchairs or hospital beds sooner, but it would take six weeks, eight weeks, sometimes even three months to have got it. When So collaborating with them has helped us reduce the time to get them the what they need. We also um, have the specialists and consultants as a part of this group, whether they are a part of UT Health or not. We do have a relationship with them. And uh, we encourage, like, we tell and educate our patients and family members. We've made these stickers that they can put on the refrigerator to call us and to communicate with us any changes and not to make any changes without they really collaborate with us as primary care to make sure that we are all on the same page. So we used to call this model as the UT senior health model. And we realized it doesn't speak of the heart of what we do. Our mission, vision, and motto has always been treat each and every person that comes in, into our clinic or is a part of our practice just the way we would want our loved ones to be treated, our parents, grandparents, ourselves. And so that's how we came up with uh, the term cariños, which in Spanish means uh, tenderness, fond fondness, and love. And we then give a mnemonic for the approach that we do. It's comprehensive care, care that we coordinate, very compassionate across various different clinical settings. And that really meets the needs of older adults from their perspective, from what matters most to them. Advocating for patients and families by collaborating and maintaining relationships with everybody in this uh, circle of health or in the carinos and respecting what matters most to older patients. Um, you know, what, we just had an example, you know, of what, so uh, building a relationship with the patient so that they can, you know, be very open and transparent and tell you what they want and don't want and building a relationship with not just the team, your own team uh, for team-based care, but with everybody, um, who is caring for the patient. And then intentionally doing having activities and processes. So we had to redesign our practice and our approach to care. And it's uh, providing healthcare, caring for a person's life is a journey. It's never done. And what worked today may not work tomorrow. So we've got to constantly keep looking at our processes and practices in place and make sure that it is really meeting the needs of the persons we're caring for and it's really impacting what matters most to them. Nurtured relationships with patients, families, with all the social uh, service agencies, community partners, consultants um, is really very important. Older adults are wise and know what they want. We just have to listen to what they say. Many times our patients know what they want, but the, the children may say that, oh, no, 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 that's not what we want. Uh, they need that. That's not what they mean. I'm pretty sure that's not what they mean. So we have got to take a step back and tell them, okay, let's at least hear them out, listen to what they have to say and ask them why they're coming up with that option. And then we have integrated supportive care for focus on quality of life. 
I know we've heard presentations where palliative care starts a, a year or something, but really I think with a diagnosis comes the um, palliative care and supportive care right from the beginning. There's a lot of support for life and not just um, uh, at the end one year. Next slide, please. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of this. We all know that the sooner we start palliative care, the better the quality of life. Now, I've used the term supportive to be more culturally respectful and appropriate for a Hispanic community. Uh, community. We have heard that there are cultural barriers and without palliative care services, uh, the, our patients really thought that palliative care meant giving up and not uh, taking care of them. So we uh, did a study um, interviews with focus groups and individuals and realized that if we named it as supportive care and told them you have a serious illness and this is a team here to support you, for all the symptoms you have and for what you need, for what matters most to you, they accepted supportive care consultations and supportive care better. Next slide, please. So despite this model, we were not reaching a lot of people. We were just at the tip of the iceberg and we realized that to go into the homes of patients, we needed culturally um, appropriate bridges or vinculos. And that's where we started working with professionally trained promotores or community health workers to um, help us better understand the barriers, what matters most to the patients and the values that they have so that we can get on the same page. Next slide, please. So this is just some statistics of where we started and how we did. Next slide, please. Okay. So the Carinius approach and the home-based supportive care, there's no one size that fits all. Each of our people uh, uh, and patients and community are different. We need to understand who they are, what they want, what are the needs and what matters most to them and start small and then expand. Next slide, please. That's in summary, the Carinius approach. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Patel, um, and thank you, everyone, um, or all the speakers uh, for all your presentations. I'd like to invite all the speakers to turn their cameras on at this point, and we'll move to um, Q and A. And also to remind the audience, uh, we've been watching, but please, if you have questions for the panel, uh, enter them into the the, the Q and A section of the Zoom function, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next. 15 minutes or so until we have to do the last few minutes for a wrap up. So um, I guess one of my uh, honors or privileges as being the moderators, I get asked the, the questions that I'll ask the first one. Um, the last session was all about payment. Um, and each of you touched on savings a little bit as one of the beneficial outcomes of your programs, or at least a, a potential benefit. But from a certain perspective, cost savings can equal lower revenue for an administrator. And so given the diversity of organizations each of you work at, um, how have each of you made these programs sustainable or the plans for sustainability from a cost perspective? Knowing that's not everything, but it's an important thing that makes the world go round. And I'll just take a volunteer if anyone wants to take a stab at that question. I can start. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Um, well, in the, in, when you're fully capitated, when, when the quality of care is good, when the patients are happy, when the doctors are happy, um, when you save, you know, you save. You, you, the, the main driver of waste in the system is unnecessary hospitalizations, which is fueled by unnecessary emergency room visits. And so when you restore the doctor-patient relationship, it's a sacred relationship. And you know, when you restore the doctor-to-doctor -doctor relationship, you know, in the communities that we're, we're, we're currently in 12 states. And when doctors aren't worried about billing, you know, we don't have a billing department. So um, it frees you up to go more upstream. It frees you up. I mean, we have, with our palliative care patients, 70 to 80% of them have advanced directives and durable power of, of, of attorneys. It becomes part of your, the culture of your care delivery, uh, which is just, I think it's near impossible in the fee-for-service system, or even in the hybrid models. And in Medicare Advantage, I think we make up, we're just a small 
fraction of a percent <laughs> with the fully capitated Medicare, Medicare Advantage. I can jump in. I think oh, yeah. uh, we, we've had a very a small sample thus far, and we're, we've really just focused on getting the implementation, being aware that if if this is going to scale up, what, what we've got and be sustainable, we've got to demonstrate to our, to our institution that, that it's it's sustainable financially. Um, but so we're, we're not there yet. But that's <laughs> that's uh, that's on our minds as we do the work. Okay. And, and Dr. Patel, I think that was one of the slides you kind of glanced over at the end a little bit, like there's the, some statistics there, but is it working so far in your home institution or? Yes, it is. So basically um, our motto has been that do what's right for the person and everything else falls right into place. And honestly, our Carinius approach has shown that to all of UT. In fact, they call, they've adapted our approach for our ACO as the UT health way of doing things for patient care. And, um, you know, the, we still are largely fee for service and we've got some foundation grants for like hiring our promotora and all that. But our plan is to use the money that we save or the value-based dollars that we get to integrate the promotoras into our model of care because they're so important to the cultural barriers and doing right for the community and the patients at home. So um, every time we do have administrator or our ACO showing us our metrics and saying, hey, and they look, our, our metrics, our ER admission, uh, admissions are the least. They do see that we have a little bit more spend in the home health. And I tell them, look at the person and look at the whole picture. Don't look at pieces of it. Look at the whole person and don't look at body parts, okay? This could be your mom, it could be your dad. Are exactly. you going to say they're not going to need home health or they're not going to need uh, that acute rehab? I said, well, if you don't, I've, I've spoken to so many of the Humana or WellMed or United, the, um, for prior authorizations and I've said, okay, well, if you don't want to help, I'm just sending the patient to the emergency room. <laughs> <laughs> you know? you, you've got to put yourself in that position and try to understand, you know, do what's right for the person. This could be you. So uh, we found like, even in the COVID year, like as the, Dr. Eid said, every practice was done. Ours was the only practice that was that sustaining and doing better because it was just doing the right thing. We found ways, we hired promotoras to go with the iPads and the hotspots so that you know patients who didn't have technology, we could do telehealth visits with them and take care of their needs and prevent that ER visit and that hospitalization. Well, excellent. Um, I have one other question that's kind of a little bit of a side a curveball, I guess. Um, it came up actually in the audience Q&A is that the planning committee made a decision kind of early on to not include a, an explicit discussion of pediatric palliative care due to the time constraints and the detail you need to discuss that. And I know um, the VA and Chen Med are more geared towards the geriatrics populations. You might have much not have much to say about how your care models uh, go to pediatrics palliative care, but I didn't know if Dr. Patel or Dr. Swiderski had any thoughts or lessons about how these what, how what they're doing might translate into pediatric palliative care? Geriatrics and pediatrics are very similar. We use similar strategies in both the ends. And I think the Carinos model would work fantastic in a pediatric population as well. In um, fact, UT Health, when they've made it as the UT Health way, they're using this model of care for our pediatric population as well. Right, so my work, uh, our work focuses more on the communication aspect of it, right? And I think um, it's clear to me that these are difficult conversations for pediatricians to have as well. And so I'm, I'm convinced that this approach using a checklist um, is probably a good idea. Uh, as you know, I have to give credit again to Ariadne Labs, which is the originator of this. And I you know, I went to trainings by them and, and there was no mention of pediatrics. I have no idea if they're um, going in that direction, but before we get the proceedings published, I'll inquire and I can answer maybe a little bit more detail. But from a communications perspective, I think it's, it's a great, it, it would apply. Okay. And, and actually another question from the audience is actually for you, Dr. Swiderski. Um, 
someone actually wanted to know if how they could get their hands on the checklist. And now that I've been, my, my own practice has been transitioning to Epic, we went live the first of last week. So I, I happen to know, I think dot phrases and certain, or at least the BPAs, the best practice alerts, once they're in like the Epic ecosystem, they can be accessed, I think, by any user of Epic. So that might be one way to do it, but is there an easier way rather than having to <laughs> switch EHRs to access the checklist? Well, no, I think Ariadne would be happy. Ariadne Labs would be happy to, um, to share. So it's Ariadne Labs. Uh, and, and again, I will inquire about distribution of that, but it's in the public it's a common common domain. Yeah, it's not, it's not, um, they don't hold it tight. <laughs> they want it to go out everywhere. They, their motto is every patient, every time. So really a palliative care way of thinking about it. Hey, and then, um... Thank you for that. Um, and another question uh, for, for Dr. Syed. Uh, another thing about my own practice, I joke about the uh, hearing about the ambulatory care nirvana um, and kind of what you're, you're pitching, I mean, it felt like you were like, wow, like describing kind of this ambulatory care nirvana, but could you elaborate some more on the specifics of like the outcomes of your model? Um, and given that, you know, since it's expanding, um, given my first question about the finances, obviously the finances are working. Um, but could you maybe give some more specifics about how like patient satisfaction, the outcomes um, and, you know, clinician satisfaction from the model and how it can maybe be expanded more in a non-capitated world, maybe? I, I don't think that it could be expanded in a non-capitated world. Um, there are too many restrictions to, there's, there's not enough integration. Um, there, the, the, the doctor, the doctor-patient relationship is not at the center of the care delivery model. You know, basically, you have doctors doing all the work that everybody else should be doing. If you look at even the EHRs, you're mentioning the EHRs, we had to develop our own EHR. One of our companies is actually a tech company because most of the EHRs are designed for billing and for referrals. But when you have a, when you have a system that is a relationship-based system, we needed an EHR that was actually, it's a style of delivery, healthcare delivery that's 35, 40 years old. Uh, so we needed a simple, just effective um, uh, uh, EHR that uh, would be, that was doctor, doctor friendly. And, um, and so I, I, I really don't know if, uh, how, I'm trying to think, you know, with the billing model, when the doctors are more concerned with the billing, you know, they, they, they're more, they're, their minds aren't there. They're kind of being pulled in different directions. We have top decile quality with HEDIS and with patient satisfaction. Our NPS scores are always in the top. Uh, we have 30 to 40% fewer emergency room visits, significantly reduced um, at admissions to the hospital. I mean, if, you, if you want to look at, say, something like flu vaccination rates, you know, as a country, we haven't crossed the 50% mark with American adults getting vaccinated against the flu. And in neighborhoods where we have, we have centers in New Orleans where the life expectancy is in the mid to late 50s. And in those neighborhoods, our doctors have 97, 98% of their patients vaccinated against the flu uh, because they have those relationships, probably in the most prevention hesitant parts of the country. So when, when you're talking about true health outcomes, you know, we should be looking at the basics, you know, patient satisfaction, doctor satisfaction, and, um, and then overall cost is improved. And people, you know, you have doctors that are, that are doing what they all wanted to do when we went into medicine. None of us got into medicine to be concerned about the prior authorizations, fighting with people to get prior, things like that. I mean, this is it's absolutely ridiculous. I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry. I, yeah, no, it's, that, that was my, very helpful. My background is FQHC. I joined, I, after residency, I, I, um, I joined an FQHC in Tampa. I was, I was one of the largest FQHCs in the country. We had over 100,000 patients. I became the chief medical officer there, there about a year and a half after joining and um, 30 to 40,000 of our patients were unfunded. So I've seen, I have PTSD from the worst of the fee-for-service system. And now I'm in the same exact neighborhoods with some of the best outcomes in the country. Well, excellent. Um, just looking at the time, I wanna make sure I get a question for Dr. Eads. Um, what I was, I haven't worked in an emergency room since I was a resident, but I do know that it was all about throughput and they don't like people kind of milling around and it's, you know, admit, uh, admit or discharge and um, reading, kind of hearing about your model, it sounds like 
in order to do the geriatric assessment and really bring this serious illness and this assessment of the, the veteran um, in the ER, it seems like that would be a major impediment to throughput. Um, how is that being handled and how has that been done? Or is this just a cultural difference of an ER when it has the certification? I think we're still learning from the experience, both ours and, and those outside the VA who are building geriatric emergency departments, but it really looks good. I mean, you're, you're separating those who have a true surgical medical emergency and you're focused on taking care of that as you would in a normal emergency department, but then you're getting to, that you're actually helping get people out um, safely and less returns, less hospitalization, less returns to the emergency department by having an interdisciplinary team and very often connected with someone in the primary care team to coordinate the care, to identify some issues that will help get that person actually out of the emergency department faster, get them out of the waiting area faster. So uh, I think in those ways, it's looking good. Also, we just wanna to touch on the broader economics. Yes, VA is an integrated healthcare system. It fits kind of closely in that capitated model concept with the broad spectrum of services we provide, but we learn from other systems. We bring our innovations outside as well. And, and in that space, and we train 70% of the healthcare workforce in this country with, um, and, and so in the issue of economics, I just three points I wanna make. One is that it's important to, when you're having conversations with your fiscal officers and folks, Keep in mind that generally the margin is about 4%. So if you avoid a $10,000 hospitalization, you're not losing $10,000 for the hospital, you're losing $400. And, and so that's an important concept to keep in mind. And then another one is that patients and their families talk with each other. So you're like, your reputation is likely to spread and more people will come to you because you're doing coordinated primary care. You're having an effective emergency department for urgent care issues. You're, you're providing services in the home. Those are, those are really important to people. And that the last thing is for all of us, it's kind of been alluded to, but this half, um, you know, 50% of our healthcare expenditures go to about 10% of the population. Um, many of the majority of whom have chronic serious disabling conditions. That's the expensive part, but that's not a population. That really represents everyone, nearly every one of us and our children and our parents at a phase of our lives. So let's all work together and get this right. Excellent. Um, and I know I think Phil's gonna turn on his camera in about one minute to close up. In fact, there he is. So I was gonna try to maybe squeeze in one more question, but there he comes as my visual cue to, no, he's saying, you're saying go? Yep. One, one, one more question. All right. One minute. Okay. Um, so I'll save the last one for uh, Dr. Swiderski. Um, the patient voice, we purposely kind of tried to infuse the patient perspective throughout here with some, you know, stories from patients and patients on other panels. And um, how have patients embraced, you talked about the physician side of kind of the, you know, reluctance maybe on using a checklist. And you talked about the physicians were, you know, embracing it once they used it. But do you have any final say on how the patients embrace this from their end? And then Thank you for asking. Um, that is the, the current phase of our work, actually. So we've gotten some foundation funding uh, to, to study just that. Uh, so we're implementing to an additional two or three FQHCs in our network. And after these conversations have been had, we're now going to do a qualitative, we're going to do qualitative analysis of patient, patient reactions. Um, it's interesting, though, I think in my slides, I said that um, doctors had had the feeling <laughs> that those visits were very, very meaningful for both them and their patients. And frequently what the patient said on the way out was, thank you very much, doctor, for this. Um, so um, I'm really, I think that's the most important thing um, is, to, is to document the patient reaction to this. Um, you know, the literature tells us that patients, and it's been alluded to today, that patients want to have these conversations. And the literature tells us that doctors believe it's important. Um, but now I think we need to document that it's a good thing for patients. Um, and, and I just want to also echo some, some things that have been said before, but really this is not about dying, the work that we're doing. I think several people kind of mentioned this, it's about living. How do you want to live? Um, this is not about um, terminal, terminal care. It's not about molded and pulsed. It's about, you have time left. How, how do you best want, what matters to you has been said. 
So I, that's, I'm very excited to, to do that. And I hope we have another one of these in another 18 months and I can tell you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, thank you all to the speakers of our final session and all the congratulations on the work you're doing. And similar to that comment, I hope to see um, how it pans out in the future. And Phil, I will hand back to you to take us home. Excellent. So I, I, I have some just brief closing remarks, which I would like to start with just a, thank you. Thank you first to all of our panelists and presenters. We gave them the unenviable challenge of uh, presenting in a very short time window, but appreciate the thoughtfulness and their engagement during discussion. Um, I want to thank all of our moderators who helped to shape that discussion and really dive deep on each of the the, the sessions over these past two Thursdays. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ada Stewart, who, um, who is the current president of the American Academy of Family Physicians, who opened our webinar last week. Um, and, and first and foremost, I want to thank our, 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 our two patients who shared their experience. Shirley Roberson, who was with us last week, and Michael Olex, who opened up uh, today's session and then join us in the panel discussion. Um, a great thanks to my co-chair, Dr. Patricia Davidson, who has continued to provide service from uh, the, the, literally the other side of the world and to our planning committee. Uh, you know, the, the, those of you who have been engaged in uh, the nascent workshop planning committees, we ask a lot of that group that they met uh, uh, diligently and thoughtfully and, and, and put together a terrific program, which, which frankly uh, exceeded expectations from where, where I sit. And then I also wanted to thank the expert staff at, at NASM, um, Lori, Greg, Caitlin Friedman, and Anisia Wilkes, without whom uh, none of this would have been possible. And of, of course, the Serious Illness Roundtable and all of its members for supporting this work. In, in brief reflection over the past two weeks, I think what we set out to do was to elevate a conversation that's been going on for some time, which is how do we improve the experience that patients with serious illness uh, encounter throughout their journey. I think we started last week by highlighting the, the close and interlocking principles that underlie both specialty palliative care and primary care as, as laid out in the National Consensus Project guidelines and also the shared principles of primary care. We then also kind of high the the, 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 the the foundational in, in importance of the interdisciplinary team uh, in, in delivering that care. And, and in reflecting in my own professional life and in the discussion, I think what we unearthed was a, a deep commitment to that team, but perhaps different conceptions and, and, and explications and deployments of those teams over time. So some of them expressively working together, some working more in coordination with one another. I think that's a really important area of focus for us going forward. And then this week we took on the important aspects of quality with a big focus on value, both the importance of quality and actually helping to control cost. And Reflecting back on the interdisciplinary team, I think what we highlighted was the need for better payment to deliver better care. And then I want to thank all of our presenters in, in session four, which is really meant to be the culmination of the workshop to highlight work that's being done on the ground today to move the needle. So as I said, Today, we elevated and continue the conversation. There's, there is more work for us to do together, but with, with the support of this community and, and, with, and with organizations like the academies, I am certain that we can make progress. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to joining us for future workshops.